let's get started. What class is this? I don't even know. ER. ER. Finally get to learn. This is like <laughs> the week of toxicology. It's great because I get to do it all in farm and I get to do it here. You guys get to learn all about my favorite subject in the whole wide world. It's fantastic. Um, hmm? It's like an overdose of toxicology. Who would have guessed it was even possible? Thank you. It's wonderful. Wonderful joke. I would not have made it myself. Because um, I'm not that smart. You know? Anyway, uh, so we are talking about uh, quite a potpourri of poisons here, as you'll see. Um, and again, I, I've done an entire elective for all the stuff we're covering today before, so I could talk about this stuff ad nauseum. Give me an Ipecac. I'll make you throw up. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I can talk about this stuff a lot, but mainly we want to just kind of get the, the gist here of what are the basics, what are the things you really want to know, because again, you always have a consultant available. If you run into these patients in the ER, you can always call the poison center. What's the number? 1-800-222-1222. I get like a quarter of a cent every time someone calls, so I'm just kidding, I don't get paid. Uh, but it's a good number to know, right? Because again, anytime you run into these patients, and it could be anywhere, you always have a toxicologist you can talk with. There's always someone who's uh, on, on call for them. Anyway, um, we'll cover briefly about the toxidromes. Again, we're gonna, this is all review for, for some of these things. Um, but we'll get into a lot of new substances that we've not, we don't have time to really cover in farm. Um, and again, if you have any questions, just stop me, let me know, and we'll, we'll go from there. I'll probably post this. I'll post a link uh, for the video if you want to go back and review it under the CMS course, uh, and it'll be on the YouTube channel, so you can find that if you need to. Um, anyway. So getting into it, um, as you know, anything can be poisonous, right? Just depends on the dose. Can oxygen be poisonous? Absolutely, right? How, how's it poisonous? Well, it can form reactive oxygen species, right? Because oxidative damage, right? Can damage things, uh, cause barotrauma if you're giving too much oxygen in the lungs, all, all kinds of things. How about water? Is water poisonous? What happens if you get too much water? Hyponatremia, you can die from that, right? So, uh, anyone ever remember uh, there was a, a lady who died from the Hold Your Wee for a Wee contest, right? The lady is to see how much water you could drink and hold on to it before you had to urinate. And if you won, you got a Nintendo Wii, because at the time it was very hard to get. Uh, did not go well for that lady. She ended up dying from hyponatremia. So, again, um, I don't know if they buried her with the Wii or what, but she, <laughs> I'd say she at least deserved one, or at least the family did. Um, <laughs> But regardless, um, the mechanism of toxicity can vary wildly depending on what you're talking about, right? Whether it's lead, whether it's cyanide, whether it's any of these things. Uh, so it's important to know the mechanism for how they're causing toxicity because that will directly lead to what kind of pharmacologic effects you're going to see and then what, how we're going to actually treat that, right? And again, the main thing to know is that is there going to be an antidote for all these things we're talking about? Generally, no, but it's important to know which ones do have antidotes so you can act on this quickly, and also what is the support of care to go along with these things, right? So again, any kind of toxin-induced seizure is going to be managed the same exact way. What am I going to give? Toxin-induced seizure. What would you give for a normal seizure? Benzos, right? Ativan, Bursa, Diazepam, any of those are going to be really good. Again, the treatment is going to be the largest number of these. Uh, if you have a patient's hypotensive from a poison, what are you going to give them? What did you do before the vasopressor fluids, right? You can get fluids and then talk about your vasopressor, right? Norepi is a good one, right? We talked about that yesterday, I believe. Um, so again, a lot of the supportive care is going to be the same regardless, and so it's just important to know which ones have antidotes, which you can be using, when to use, etc. So we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, and again, anything can have a toxic level. It just depends on, you know, um, whether or not it's even reasonable to get to that level. So if you think about it, like uh, with caffeine, can caffeine be lethal? Absolutely, right? But again, it depends on the dose. If you actually programmed in, you know, based on the mill the LD50 for caffeine, how many cups of coffee you'd have to drink, you'd probably die from the hyponatremia of all the water you're consuming before you would the actual caffeine. So a lot of it depends on how concentrated of a dose you can get, lots of, lots of different factors here. Anyway, as you remember, the toxidromes, what are the main toxidromes we talked about in, in farm? That's a good one we covered. Anticholinergic, right? What's the mnemonic for that? Lines a bat, mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, red as a beet, hot as a hair, hot as Hades. That probably makes a little bit more sense. I don't know. Hot as a hair. I never, don't know hairs to be all that hot, but um, maybe like, who's a, who's a Lola Bunny from Space Jam? I think a lot of people probably had some feelings, mixed feelings about that. Uh, um, and it was the other thing. How about the heart? <laughs> Getting tech card just thinking about it. <laughs> 
Anyway, okay, what's another toxic neuron? <laughs> 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 They're not going to let me do this class again. <laughs> okay, another toxic germ we covered. Hmm? The dumbbells. Dumbbells go with what? The cholinergics, right? And specifically, which type of receptor? Muscarinic receptors, right? So remember, leaking fluids everywhere, bradycardia, bronchorrhea, all that good stuff. How about the nicotinic effects? You can see with those. It's weak, hypertension, weakness, fasciculations. Right, because the activation of those uh, nicotinic receptors on the nerve muscle in plate. What else? How about blood pressure? Hypertension. Good. How about that? Peoples? Hydriasis. Right. So, again, so because when we see these patients frequently, don't know what the heck they even were exposed to in the first place. So, it's our job to kind of go through, see what they're showing us, go through the signs and symptoms, and see, okay, well, based off this, this is what I think it could be. And that's where the toxidrome is really useful for that, right? Um, so again, so other things we'll talk about briefly, we'll cover uh, decontamination again. We talked about a lot of the GI decontamination methods, such as, what are some things we used? Yes, yeah. lavage, right? What was the time frame we, we want to use a lot of those GI decontamination methods? So then and then went an hour, right? Now again, if you have a patient who comes in and they were down for an unknown period of time, or maybe they are giving you an inconsistent history and you don't know if you're within an hour, are you going to do it? No. Usually the return on investment is not going to be good enough at that point. So you're just going to say, well, if we don't really know, if we're not sure, just go ahead and skip it. Because chances are you're probably outside of the hour range. Um, I can probably say that uh, the vast minority of cases, patients actually present with enough time within that hour to actually um, uh, make use of things like activated charcoal, lavage, and things like that. Now, what about Ipecac? Do we still do that? No. Really, lavage, the, um, uh, using uh, activated charcoal, those are probably the more, more common ones. Charcoal, much more commonly than lavage. Because what, what are the concerns with using something like lavage? Aspiration is a big thing, yeah, absolutely, right? And again, make sure your NG-tube is placed appropriately. Also, what are the other contraindications to lavage? Yeah, the object's too big to make it through. What, else, what kind of substances? Corrosive. Yeah, corrosive stuff, right? Anything corrosive, you don't want to have a chance of it coming back up. So that's why it's also a contraindication for something like charcoal, right? Again, uh, anything that burns on the way down is going to burn on the way back up, okay? Um, right, and, you know, so we'll talk about some other points here as well. Uh, we'll talk about labs briefly to see how that can be useful for us, and then antidotes. And, and, and when I say enhanced elimination, what does that mean? Um... Not necessary. To go light, we still consider it to be GI decontamination, right? Because it helps to prevent absorption of the substance in the first place. It's a good thought, though. Um, but these are going to be modalities that help us to get rid of stuff once it's already in the body. So this is where things like dialysis will come into play. We'll talk about some other methods as well. So once this drug is in the system, how do we get rid of that more quickly? So anyway, as far as decontamination goes, again, if you have a patient who is maybe CNS depressed to the point where they're not protecting their airway, or you think that they may be heading that direction, oftentimes we'll go ahead and um, you know, play it safe and go ahead and intubate. Again, what kind of drugs can we use to intubate? Use propofol. You could use Tomidate. Tomidate is probably the most common one you're going to run into. Ketamine could be used potentially. Right. And again, Tomidate is nice because it's very um, cardiovascularly neutral, right? Because these patients may come in hypertensive, maybe hypotensive. Tomidate is good from that standpoint, right? Um, what about paralytic wise? Succinylcholine could be used. What else? Rocuronium, vecuronium. For again, these patients, again, if you're not sure what the potassium levels are looking like, if you're not sure whether stuff's on board, rocuronium is going to be a little bit safer because, again, you don't have any of those contraindications with the potassium or the, the crush injuries, burn injuries, uh, you know, any kind of. Um, uh, you know, things like ALS and, and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, you know, things like that. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff with rock so it's a little bit safer from that regard. Um, but again, when might, uh, as far as decontamination goes, when might that hour, that kind of golden hour to initiate decontamination, why might that be extended a little bit? Opioids and anticholinergics, right? Why? So it's down peristalsis, right? So we know, so especially if you listen and it sounds like they have diminished bowel sounds, it's been within two hours of ingestion, go ahead and try to give that activated charcoal if you can, or lavage potentially, uh, if it's one of those, what we consider to be a life-threatening ingestion. And again, you'll get a feel for what those kind of substances are a little bit later, right? So you know when I talk about sphincter tone, right? So some things will cause you to be like, you know, two or three, not really that dangerous, like an SSRI, not that bad, right? Versus like a TCA, that's like an 11, okay? So that's what we, some things we consider to be life-threatening ingestions. Anyway, um, now charcoal. So Melissa had a very good question. What was your question? Yeah, so um, what you'll find is that for a lot of patients, when they are presenting, even after self-harm, a lot of times they're kind of either embarrassed about it or they are depressed enough or they're not usually going to be that um, – um, 
not really going to be fighting on that one, right? So if you tell them to drink it, I usually don't have too many issues with those patients doing it. More often than not, it's really the texture and things like that that kind of prevent the patient from really getting the dose in. Um, but you could always do things like if you need to initiate chemical restraints, potentially we don't usually resort to that. However, if you need to place an NG tube, we can also get the charcoal down that way. That would be one way to um, try to get the dose in the patient. But again, think about time as your, as your enemy in that situation there. By the time you'd be able to get the NG tube, if NG tube placed in order to get the charcoal down, it's probably past the hour anyway, right? So think about things like that in terms of what's gonna be reasonable or not. If you can't get the charcoal in, it might make some difference, but in the long run, it might not make a ton of difference. So like I said, it's usually the minority of cases are for patients that actually get charcoal in the first place, right? And again, we talk about decontamination of the skin. What are some caveats to remember with uh, skin decontamination? Say so someone spilled an organophosphate onto their clothes, get the clothes off, right? Eliminate further exposure. What else do you have to think about? If patients are obese, make sure you're getting skin folds and things like that. Make sure you, and what, what do I use to decontaminate the skin with? Water can be useful, but more safe is to use soap and water, dilute bleach. Any of those things are going to be good because that way you make sure you get things that are both hydro and lipophilic off the skin, right? That's going to be the, the safest thing to do for the patients there. Good. Again, now when I say, you know, uh, treat the patient, not the poison, what does that mean? Right, you got to stabilize them first, right? So you got to deal with the, the most life-threatening things first. They may have this drug ingestion they're dealing with, but if their airway is not um, secure, if they are not breathing, or if they're not circulating, you got to deal with that stuff first. Otherwise, the patient's going to die before you say, I'm going to initiate this really good antidote. Well, the patient's already dead. It's not going to do you a whole lot of good, right? So those are always going to be really, really important. Make sure you're going to stabilize the patient first. Consider if there's any coexisting trauma. Like when you think about intoxicated individuals, sometimes they're not making very good decisions. They like to get behind the wheel of a car, or like I mentioned, that patient who is... Uh, huffing toluene in the back of a Walmart. How, what, why was he presenting to the hospital? Got hit by a shopping cart and, and then cracked his hip, right? He was having a good time before that happened. So again, some of these patients, not everything is, is self-harm. Not everything is, is intentional. Sometimes these patients are presenting for other reasons. So car wrecks are a very common thing we run into with that. Um, you know, you think about burns and, and things like carbon dioxide exposure and cyanide exposure. That happens a lot in house fires too, right? So you may be managing a lot of um, other comorbid kind of conditions happening right at that moment there. And again, cardiac and hemodynamic monitoring is super, super important here to kind of tell us what's going on uh, from the vital signs standpoint. If you can do entitled CO2 monitoring, that's really good for sedative agents because you can tell if they're not really um, oxygenating appropriately and you're blowing off that CO2 like they should. Okay. Okay, so if you have a patient who presents with ultra mental status, you just depressed mental status, they present comatose, again, some things you can give to try to reverse those initially include things like naloxone, which is going to be good for what? Right, so again, like I mentioned, what's one of the most common things people are going to present with in terms of overdose? Opioids, right? We're in the middle of opioid epidemic. We have a lot of prescription opioid abuse. We also, nowadays, we have a lot more heroin use in Florida because a lot of the pill mills got shut down. And um, again, when you get heroin, what else could be mixed in there? Literally anything could be mixed in there, right? But what's the one thing of concern? Really potent opioid. Fentanyl, yeah, fentanyl's been a big thing. There's other derivatives like carfentanil and things like that. So patients, uh, if you find someone down, it's really going to be, if you're weighing the risk and benefits, give them some Narcan to see if they wake up. Not a whole lot of risk with that, right? What is the one risk of Narcan? Withdrawal, right? And so I'd rather the patient be alive and breathing and really mad at me because I reversed all the heroin they had just paid for versus dead, right? So um, things like thiamine can be useful for if patients who are alcoholic or have malnutrition, right? Because who knows from cephalopathy it can be associated with that. And then dextrose if you suspect hypoglycemia. However, an AccuCheck is really easy to get. Um, you know, if by giving dextrose IV, like you already have to get an IV anyway. You know, the AccuCheck can just do a finger stick and you already have your answer right there. So sometimes that can be ruled out before you even uh, need to give it. Okay. Um, so again, as I mentioned, why is the history sometimes fraught with these patients? They're either altered enough where they can't communicate with you or what they're communicating doesn't make any sense. I saw that a lot with the bath salts. We'd ask some questions. I remember this one guy I was trying to interview. Um, he'd come in after uh, doing some bath salts. Uh, to his credit, he actually tried to take a bath with the bath salts, according to his history. Um, but I'd say, hey, you know, how are you doing? Like, you know, do you know where you're at right now? He's like, you know what? This hand is here, but this hand is home. And I was like, okay, great. So, um, <laughs> So history is oftentimes going to be unreliable or not super useful, right? So, um, so again, consider other ways to get that information, right? So who was around the patient at the time, you know, if it's family members, if they can provide uh, useful information that is, is handy. Um, what other resources do we have to find out maybe what medications a patient is on? Family. Family's good, right? Well, who else? 
you know, that's gonna be very useful, right? So again, what was the scene like? Did they have any pill bottles that were around there? Where, you know, what was the state, state of the situation? That's really important too, because when again, when uh, EMS comes and brings a patient in, what are they oftentimes in a rush to do? Get back out to the next call, right? So again, try to get EMS, try to get their run sheet, try to get the information from them while they're there, because they can be a very, very useful um, uh, bit of history they can, they can provide uh, in those cases. Um, what else could you use? Anyway, tell what a patient's actually been filling at the pharmacies. Remember E-Force? Remember we talked about that? That's all for all controlled substances. So if a patient has filled a controlled substance anytime in the past few years, you can check E-Force and see what they're filling. You can see what pharmacy they filled it at, and guess what you can do then? Call the pharmacy and see what else they have on there. Or if you're in a bind, you didn't, say, have access to E-Force, guess where most people probably fill their prescriptions? CVS? Walgreens? Or Walmart, you know, one of the publics, right? So you can call the common ones, and then they all interconnect with one another. So every CVS knows what every other CVS is doing. You can get that history there, right? Uh, so that can be sometimes useful. Officer getting vital signs. And then our physical exam is going to be really focusing, one, on the neuro aspects of things. So again, like, you know, are they even with it at all? What, how depresses their mental status or elevated their mental status, as the case may be. Um, bowel sounds are really important to listen to as well. And we're also going to be focusing on things like, is there clonus that's uh, uh, present? You know, does there increase muscular rigidity? Because that could be signs of things like NMS. could be signs of serotonin syndrome. These are all things we kind of want to focus on from that standpoint. Uh, so laboratory analysis, so what kind of labs are going to be useful for our patients? CBCs, not generally super useful for, for toxicology. Um, I don't routinely recommend ordering one. However, with a patient presenting with altered mental stats, what else could it be? Non-tox related. Could be, yeah, infections are usually one of the big ones, right? You always want to rule out things like meningitis or pneumonia or sepsis, et cetera. Um, so they're probably going to order a CBC anyway, because again, I'm coming at it from the tox perspective, but you got to consider all the other medical stuff that it could be as well. So CBCs will probably be ordered regardless, but not super useful for these purposes. Electrolytes are going to be good, because what can I get on a basic metabolic panel? Get my electrolytes, such as sodium. potassium, sodium. sodium, chloride. My bicarb, good. So I can tell a lot with that already, right? I can tell what the sodium is. So if they're hyponatremic, well, that tells me something's going on. Uh, I can tell if they have what kind of gap? An anion gap, right? So I can see if they have a uh, wide gap acidosis potentially. And then what else do you get on that Chem 7? Even creatinine, so I can determine renal function, which is good. And then what else? Glucose, right? So again, if they're hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic, that could all be informing what's going on with the patient, okay? Um, so as I mentioned, how do you calculate your anion gap? Sodium minus chloride plus bicarb, right? So chloride and bicarb added together, subtract it from the sodium. So positives minus your negatives, and that should give you your gap. Again, what do I consider to be abnormal? Anything above 16. It's, really, it's usually 12 plus or minus 4, but anything above 16 I consider to be abnormal at that point. Now, um, how about ABG? What could that be useful for helping me to determine? The acid base status is good. What else? So some other things I can tell, and especially if you get an ABG with co-oximetry, that is very useful because one, I can get things like carbon monoxide levels. So I can determine if there's a lot of carbon monoxide that may be displacing oxygen from the hemoglobin. I can look at met hemoglobin levels, which is good if I have any like, strong oxidizers on board. Do you remember any drugs we talked about causing met hemoglobinemia? It's a local anesthetic. A benzocaine actually can do it, right? So uh, if you ever see like cetacaine spray or something like that, patients may get too much uh, benzocaine or or gel, things like that. That can develop a hemoglobinemia. Usually what color do patients present as with that? They're blue, right? So again, even though they don't appear to be hypoxic because they're breathing and talking to you normally, they, they appear cyanotic, right? So again, that's usually should key you into methemoglobinemia. Um, so that's all very useful. I can determine a lot of things from that. Um, I can also look to see, is it a respiratory acidosis or alkalosis? I can determine if it's more metabolic along with the, the Chem 7, so I can get a lot of information from that. So for instance, if I, I remember one patient we had who we were suspecting aspirin toxicity in. However, the lab was like, oh, we can't get aspirin levels right now. Uh, well, how are we going to tell if it's aspirin toxicity? Well, we went ahead and got an ABG, and sure enough, the patient had a respiratory alkalosis. And that's very inconsistent with a lot of other poisonings, but very consistent with, uh, with aspirin. We went ahead and initiated treatment, and sure enough, when the lab was able to get the assay back up, we were able to, uh, to confirm the yes, absolute patient did have it, and we were able to get treatment on board uh, pretty quickly there. Um, your analysis is of limited utility. When might your analysis be useful in particular poisonings? So actually, there's a couple of ones. Um, so for instance, one, if you have rhabdo, that can be useful if you can determine if you have myoglobin spilling out in the urine, you can look for blood and things like that. Uh, imagine you have like a anticoagulant on board, you look for blood there. Um, the other big thing to note is going to be things like calcium oxalate crystals. We know it can cause that. 
Antifreeze, yeah. So ethylene glycol can actually produce calcium oxalate crystals, and that is one of the things we can use to, to determine that, right? Um, now, looking at serum and urine toxicology, as I mentioned, limited reliability. You have to know what's going to be false positives, what's going to be false negatives. Um, and again, you cannot always hang your hat on that. You need to make sure you're going to dig a little deeper. Find people tend to pigeonhole patients once they get that urine tox back, and then they say, okay, well, I know exactly what it is or isn't. And it's usually not the whole story there. Okay. Um, salicylates and acetaminophen. You don't always have to get a salicylate because it has a pretty good toxidrome associated with it, that respiratory alkalosis, tachypnea associated with that, hyperthermia, sweating. Um, but do you always need to get an, a Tylenol? Anytime you have an intentional ingestion, you always have to get a Tylenol because what's the toxidrome for Tylenol? Nothing. I, basically, a little bit, maybe some stomach upset, but nothing for the first 24, 36 hours. You're not going to see anything, right? So that's why you always want to check that. When would you get an ethanol level? Hmm? If what? So if you have someone with a depressed or ultramental status, like go ahead and check an ethanol, right? Because very frequently, um, that may not be the predominant thing that's causing their clinical picture, but it's a very frequent co-ingestion. A lot of depressed people, they'll take their pills and they'll also take alcohol along with it. So that's good and can help you out to determine kind of what's going on there. Also, you know, you think about radiator fluid, you know, antifreeze, windshield washer fluid. Oftentimes those patients are drinking that stuff because they run out of their regular alcohol. So sometimes they may actually have both on board. That's where that can be very useful as well. Okay. Um, EKG is what am I looking for there? Prolongations of QT prolongation is a huge one, right? Anything blocking potassium efflux is going to cause QT prolongation. I think it'll lead to torsades, so I'm looking for that. What else? You look for ischemia. Yeah, so imagine you have someone that has a cocaine uh, exposure and they're coming for cocaine chest pain, right? So you can look, look for an MI. What else? Go about the prolongations. QRS prolongation is another one. We'll, we can see that if you have like a sodium channel block or like a TCA or something, that can actually prolong out and can lead to arrhythmias as well. So that's a very useful thing. Always want to check with like previous EKGs to see like is that normal for the patient? Is that prolonged? Kind of what's, what's the difference here? Um, chest x-ray, is that ever going to be useful for us? Occasionally, sometimes if they have maybe like a hydrocarbon ingestion or something, you're starting to see a pneumonitis develop. You may start to see some uh, some stuff on the, uh, on the x-ray, but not, not super commonly. Um, how about an osmolar gap? useful. Hmm? Yeah, so what, what contributes to the uh, the osmolarity in the blood? The major contributor? Sodium, BUN, and glucose, right? So again, we can check to see if there's anything else floating around in the blood that maybe shouldn't be there normally, right? The most common thing you'll see that can cause a gap would be your ethanol which is good because we can get a level and determine if that's going to be contributing uh, as well right there. Um, the nice thing that we'll do uh, is we'll use the osmolar gap. We'll determine that based off the Chem 7, right, because that gives me my sodium, BUN, and glucose. I'm not going to ask you to calculate it, but just that's what you need. And then we'll measure that with an ethanol, factor that into it, and then we can see, okay, is there still something else there? And that's frequently where we have those alcoholics who maybe run out of their normal ethanol, switch over to antifreeze, and then we can determine, okay, well, this gap here, could be this level of ethylene glycol is on board. And that could be very uh, good information to have because that may lead us to initiate testing. Now, again, if you, depending on where you practice, you may find here in the south where it's a lot warmer, we don't see a lot of antifreeze ingestion, right? Because we don't use a ton of it. Um, and so we don't run levels normally for that. However, if you go to like Chicago, if you go up to New York, places like that where it's much more frequent, they have levels available right there in the hospital. So you can order that stuff very quickly. So again, sometimes there's regional differences in practice. And the lactates are good for determining what? Yeah, so again, if some process causing acidosis, usually lactate will start to be formed here as well. So cyanide, carbon monoxide, anything causing hypoxia will lead to uh, lactic acidosis developing. Okay, so as I mentioned, antidotes may help to reverse the effects of a toxin, but very few things actually have a true antidote associated with it. We'll cover a few of those today. We've already talked about a few before. Um, what are some examples of antidotes we've, we've covered? Naloxone. Hmm? Flumazenil, yep. Yeah. I said mesno, which is kind of technically true for, for chemo, but what else? Atropine is a good one, right? Or two pan, we talked about pralidoxine being used for those organophosphates. If you had an irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, right? So we've already covered a few of those, and we'll cover a few more today as well, as we'll see. So, uh, and then looking at the enhanced elimination. So how do we get stuff out of the body more quickly? This is, a, again, a very narrow subset of substances that can be uh, amenable to this. And so this can include doing things like alkaline diuresis. Now, again, if you remember... Maybe as have nightmares about it. Remember the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation? Talked about the ionization of drugs. 
or how light dissolves like, well, this is what we're doing the opposite here. So we can actually, if we have weak acids, we can put them in an alkaline solution, like an alkaline urine, and try to make them more charged, so that way they don't get reabsorbed in the kidneys. So we do this for aspirin most routinely. We'll go ahead and, and alkalize the urine with sodium bicarb and D5, and then that way that will raise the pH of the urine up to a point where the aspirin is ionized, doesn't get reabsorbed, and just you pee it right out. All right, so again, it's enhancing the elimination of it. Um, dialysis is other the most common thing you'll end up doing for these. And again, it's a very small subset of drugs that are actually amenable to this. They need to be very small molecules. They need to be water soluble. You need to make sure they're not protein bound. Otherwise, they're going to be stuck there in the blood, and they won't cross over into the dialysis uh, machine or into the dialysate. And so, as an aspirin, you know, this uh, would apply to things like lithium is another common one we'll do, and then the toxic alcohols. And what does that refer to when I say that? Methanol and we don't usually do for isopropyl alcohol. We'll talk about that a little bit later. What's the other big one we mentioned already? Causes the calcium oxalate crystals. Ethylene glycol is the other big one. So methanol, ethylene glycol, the two most common ones we'll end up doing that uh, dialysis for. All right, so again, it's a very small subset of things, but um, when you have it available, it's super great because you can get that stuff off in just a couple hours, and you can pretty much reverse the patient's course very, very quickly, which is nice. Also, what else can dialysis do for us if I have a patient, say, with a wide gap acidosis? Remember the indications we talked about for dialysis? Acid base disturbance was a big one, right? So if I have a patient who, say, for instance, develops a lactic acidosis from metformin, maybe they have poor kidney function, and they've got some contrast, and now their kidneys are not working anymore, they're holding on to that metformin. Metformin leads to lactic acidosis, and guess what? Dialysis can be useful to not, it's not going to pull off the metformin, but it can help to get rid of that lactate. So is there another useful benefit of using dialysis for some of these patients here? Okay, so some uh, specific agents we'll talk about, and again, I could do entire hour or two hour long lectures on some of these, so again, if I seem like I'm just kind of just rambling, just stop me. Just like, hey, you need to keep moving, buddy. I'll say, okay, let me do that. Um, anywho, we uh, talked about a Tylenol already, and again, remember, it's a, kind of a silent sort of presenting drug, and very frequently, it's a co-ingestion with other things. What is it frequently co-ingested with? Oxycodone. Hydrocodone, those are the two biggest ones, right? What else? Maybe a distant third. Alcohol, yeah, that's a good one. What else? Benadryl is another big one, right? Or uh, Tylenol PM, right? That PM is the diphenhydramine to try to knock you out so you can go to sleep. That's another very frequent one we can see with that, okay? Um, and again, we'll kind of go through the staging and all that. Remember, what, what's the antidote for Tylenol? And acetylcysteine, right? Mucomist, acetidote, those are the, the typical brain injury you're going to run into. Um, so oh, went backwards. Uh, okay. So remember, there's kind of different phases of Tylenol toxicity. Um, phase one is going to be kind of what time frame? 24 to 36 hours, right? So again, there's a long time. The patients are going to look relatively well until, unless they have a really massive overdose. Um, but again, you may have some vomiting, diarrhea. But other than that, it's not going to be very specific, right? Usually, you're going to be kind of seeing the other toxic effects of like the opioids they have on board. They're much more going to be uh, much more predominant. Phase two, though, is when you get started getting to that 36, 40, maybe up to 72 hour time frame there. And what are you going to start to see then? How about laboratory wise? LTs are going to start to go up, right? And again, you can see probably the highest LTs I've ever seen are in Tylenol overdose patients, right? You see several thousands, tens of thousands of their AST and ALT, right? Billy Rubin's going to start to go up. What other um, very uh, bad portent of, of impending doom can you see on laboratory analysis in terms of liver function? PTI and is going to start to go up, right? So again, if your liver is not making clotting factors, that shows that it's not functioning. So that's actually a much better sign of liver function than AST and ALT actually are. Okay, so then they get to this phase three where, again, where they're developing things like coagulopathy, they can develop GI bleeds, they're going to be jaundice because all the bilirubin, all these things are going to be noticed here. Um, and again, they develop this hepatic encephalopathy, right? So again, they're not processing all these waste products through the liver, they get encephalopathic as well. And if they make it through all that, then they can resolve, find LT start to go back down. Um, again, the liver is very resilient in terms of organs, uh, and so you're going to find that, um, it, that people can recover. It may take some time, but they will recover. Okay. So we talked all about this. I don't have to kind of labor on that. Um, and again, just know that some patients are going to be more sensitive to Tylenol toxicity. The most common people you're going to run into are who? Probably the chronic alcoholics, right? The people who already have kind of ramped up liver enzymes anyway. They're actually going to be making more. And what's the toxic metabolite for Tylenol? In the name of it? The NAPQI. I'm not going to give you the actual full chemical name because you just kind of your eyes start rolling in the back of your heads. But just know an FQI is the main toxic metabolite, and you're going to find that people like chronic alcoholics or on enzyme-inducing drugs like 
phenytoin, things like that can actually predispose you to toxicity. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, and then, obviously, in order to determine if you need to treat, we're going to use the Rumac Matthew nomogram. And when's the first time frame you can start to check it? Four hours. Now, that again, this is only validated for a single acute ingestions. That means you took it all at one time. Some patients are going to find, especially if they've been taking it for chronic pain, they've been dosing themselves over the course of days to weeks, this is not going to be as useful for you, right? But if a patient shows up and they have any kind of Tylenol level and the LFT is already up and I have that history, I'm probably going to treat anyway, okay? So, again, if you already have evidence of obvious hepatic dysfunction, you're probably going to treat anyway, right? So, again, this is only going to be for patients who are presenting after an acute ingestion. Now, again, this is interesting because I wanted to make a point here. If you will look at the Rumac Matthew nomogram that I had in my lecture, you'll see the units are actually different here. And so, again, this is important because looking at the Tylenol concentration, the one I had on my lecture is actually micrograms per ml. This is in micromoles per liter. So this is probably a British uh, uh, graph that they pulled off of there, uh, if I had to imagine. But, again, depending on who's reporting the units, if you said, oh, they have a Tylenol level of 200, that's much different in micromoles per liter than it would be if it was in micrograms per ml. So make sure you know what units you're actually talking about here. Um, but regardless, uh, the, the most common thing you're going to see reported in the U.S. is going to be micrograms per ml. And what level at four hours is considered treatment worthy? 150, right? So just think 150 at four hours. And that's a good number to know anyway because that's going to help you with the, the actual dosing for the N-acetylcysteine. I'm not going to quiz you on specifically, but just know that 150 or 4 hours, that is the treatment line, right? And anything above possible hepatic toxicity is considered treatable. So if I have a patient who comes in and say, for instance, they were at, say, 20 hours after ingestion and their level is anywhere above this, I'm still going to go ahead and treat, right? Because I, what's the ideal time frame to start in acetylcysteine? Within 8 hours. If it's within 8, eight hours, patients are not going to die. That's at least what we've seen in studies. They present after that, there's a chance they could develop full-on hepatic failure and die from that unless they get a transplant, which is, again, pretty rare. But just know that if it's anywhere above that treatment line, go ahead and treat, even if it's past the eight hours. There still could be some additional benefits of using acetylcysteine based off its uh, free radical scavenging sort of effects. Okay. And so, again, again, just plot it on the, on the graph after an acute ingestion. It'll tell you if you need to treat with acetylcysteine or not. Okay, um, now if a patient shows up within an hour, certainly you can do charcoal. However, most patients will not show up within that time frame, so um, just keep that in the back of your mind. But we'll give N-acetylcysteine. Now we have two routes that we can administer this, IV and PO. Which one do you think patients prefer? IV, although you do have to worry about some, some uh, infusion reactions, manaflatoid reactions. It's more expensive, but for the most part, um, you'll find that we will use IV most of the time just because it's easier, especially if you have a patient who maybe is not so cooperative. You're like, here, drink this really nasty stuff that tastes like rotten eggs. You're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so IV is oftentimes what we end up uh, uh, preferring there. Now, again, if they're above that possible toxicity line on the Rumac Matthew nomogram, go ahead and do it. Um, if you have any kind of suspected acetaminophen ingestion and they have an elevated AST or ALT, and again, even if they show up and their tonal level is zero, but you have the history that maybe they overdosed on Percocet yesterday and their AST, ALT and AST are rising, that's still an indication to treat, right? Because again, I'm not so worried about the tonal level causing toxicity. I'm worried about the NAPQ causing toxicity and NAPQI, right? And then uh, if you have an unknown time of ingestion and serum level is greater than 10 mics per ml, then we're going to go ahead and treat as well, okay? So, again, oftentimes we're going to say, well, let's go ahead and treat, let's be on the safe side of things, because if we want to um, rather be a little bit more conservative, go ahead and treat them, and then if we don't need to continue treating, we can stop the stuff early potentially. Okay. And, again, typically if we have a, a known ingestion of, say, greater than 7.5 grams for an adult patient, we'll go ahead and treat at that point as well. Um, and then, again, just looking at the kind of the standard dosing here, um, Again, I'm not sure if there's any t uh, specific questions about dosing on the exam for CMS. You'll have to talk with Professor Jackson about that to get confirmation. But at least for my purposes, I'm not going to quiz you on the specific dosing here. But just know that typically with the oral, you're going to give a, a loading dose initially, right? So we get a steady state right off the bat. And then you're dosing every four hours for 17 doses. So basically, it's 72 hours worth of therapy. And then the IV form, which is actually 21 hours. So again, that's nice as well because it's a little bit quicker uh, to get that over with. Okay. Okay, so we've already covered that. Uh, so again, this is just a little bit of review. But getting into aspirin, so aspirin you're going to find is also pretty ubiquitous. You're going to find that it's easily available over the counter, which is again why we see um, not as many Tylenol overdose. We see much more Tylenol overdose than, than aspirin, but it's still something that comes up commonly enough. And again, on the sphincter tone scale of things, Tylenol is probably like 
know, five or six, like it's easily manageable if you can catch it within time, like it's pretty easy to, to deal with. Aspirin, on the other hand, can be really, really dangerous. This is one of those scary things. Um, and the way someone described it to me, you probably don't have to deal with this with like modern cars nowadays, but if anyone's ever driven like an older car, you ever notice how like the gas tank will see it like full for like a really long time and all of a sudden it's like empty and you're like, where the heck did all the gas go? That's the same thing that happens with the aspirin patients. They look really good for a long time until they decompensate and then when they do, they go down the train really quick. We'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes here. Anyway, so the biggest thing to know with aspirin toxicity is they're going to be developing this mixed respiratory alkalosis along with the metabolic acidosis. Initially, what occurs is aspirin will start to stimulate the respiratory drive. They'll get to kipnic, they'll start to blow off CO2, and they develop a respiratory alkalosis, right? So that's what they initially present with. Meanwhile, your body gets alkalotic, right? What's the normal pH for the serum? 7, 3, 5 to 7, 4, 5, right? So 7.4 right in the middle there would be considered average. Um, once it starts to get alkalotic, what does your body want to do to compensate for that? Hmm? I'm sorry, I'm silly. So, once it, so it wants to hold on CO2, but the aspirin is stimulating the respiratory drive, so it's, you're breathing that off anyway, so what else could it do? Give it a bicarb, right? So the kidneys are then going to start to, to secrete bicarb, okay? So you'll notice that the urine pH will actually start to go up because it's starting to lose all that extra bicarb to try to get the pH back to neutral. Then what happens is you're going to find that aspirin actually will start to uncouple, uncouple oxidative phosphorylation at that mitochondria, which means you switch from aerobic metabolism over to anaerobic metabolism. And then what happens to your pH when that happens? You get acidotic, right? So then that becomes a metabolic acidosis. Now, normally you could buffer that with all that bicarb, but where to go? You just peed it out, right? So again, they have this mixed picture, and then eventually they're going to be tachypnic for so long. What happens to those muscles after a while? You tire out, and then all of a sudden, now your CO2 skyrockets. You don't have any bicarb, and they develop a severe metabolic acidosis. Okay, so that's a little bit late presenting. Now, aspirin being a weak acid, when it gets into an acidic medium, what happens to this ionization? It goes down, right? It becomes much more lipid-soluble, and then where does it like to go? Across the blood-brain barrier, you develop seizures, and you die. Right, so this is the reason why it gets so scary, because when they get acidotic, they tend to decompensate very quickly because they have so much aspirin heading up to the brain. Once they start seizing, it's kind of uh, you're really behind the eight ball in those cases there. So that's something to consider. Um, again, initially they're going to be complaining of vomiting, tachypnea, may have a little bit of kind of muffled hearing or a ringing in the ears. That could be an early sign of um, uh, aspirin toxicity. Some people even get this at therapeutic doses, so it's not always you're going to see that. Um, but then later on, they get develop the seizure, coma, death that can occur here. Hypoglycemia, I mean, due to the liver effects you're going to find. Um, and so it can be very, very severe here. And keep in mind, who are patients who are normally taking aspirin say, every single day? But elderly patients, right? And they're taking for protection, and then they get a headache on top of that. So you can see how it's easy for people to inadvertently overdose themselves on, on aspirin. But certainly if you have an acute ingestion and people are intentionally harming themselves, they can get pretty, pretty bad as well. So, um, again, a dose above 160 mix per kilo is considered toxic, but a good level to know. Anything above 30 is considered potentially toxic as well. So a serum salicylate level above 30 is something that should be pretty concerning to you, right? Um, and, again, you're going to find that there's kind of an exact correlation here, but once you start getting up into the 70s, 80s, 90s, micrograms per mile, that's when patients are going to be really, really sick, and that's where you're really worried about them, especially developing that decompensation, right? So again, anything above 30 is concerning, but certainly once you get close to 100, that's where we're really going to be thinking about some of our more definitive therapies, which we'll see what those are in just a second, okay? Um, again, as they get more acidotic, you're going to be driving more drug into the tissues, and specifically the brain, and that's where things get really, really bad at that point. Also as well, if you're, um, once the kidneys are done peeing all the bicarb, the urine pH starts to go down, and what happens to reabsorption of aspirin at that point? in a more acidic medium, so it's going to start to reabsorb. So now you're not even eliminating it as quickly as you were before. So again, you can see why this is going to be a problem. So typically when you're measuring levels, now if you had a patient presented to the ER, how often do you think you'd want to be getting levels for these patients? Every two minutes, every two days, every... Usually two hours is reasonable, right? You have to think about what's logistically reasonable in a busy ER, busy ICU versus what um, ideally you'd like to see. And so, again, more frequent may be useful initially when you're trying to assess kind of where the levels are going. Because, again, one level is useful, but having two levels is good because I can tell a trend at that point. You can see where it's going. You can see when they hit a peak and then downward trend. So, generally, we'll recommend Q2 hour monitoring for levels, okay? Hopefully, if you're in the ER, you're not going to be dealing with them that long. You get them picked up to the ICU, but sometimes you have to monitor them for a couple hours to see kind of where they're going, determine what you need to do with them potentially, okay? 
Okay, so early on, if you can do activated charcoal, that's going to be beneficial, but oftentimes time is not going to be on your side from that standpoint. Um, you could maybe consider a bowel irrigation with uh, go lightly. I've not done that too, too frequently. The one case I have done it would be I um, had a patient who had actually developed a concretion. Remember what is that a concretion is? It's like a big ball of aspirin sitting in a GI tract. And so it was interesting. We'd be monitoring the levels, and all of a sudden you see it kind of spike up, and we were postulating that it was a piece of that concretion breaking off and then solubilizing and getting absorbed. So what we did for that patient is did whole bowel irrigation. We were able to kind of flush that through to prevent any further um, absorption from occurring there. Okay, So that's sometimes used, but not, not routinely. The biggest thing we can do is to give them bicarb, right? So what we can do is try to enhance the elimination with urinary alkalinization. So we put bicarb, sodium bicarb, into a bag of D5. And then you'll alkalinize the urine. Usually we're shooting for a pH of around 7.5 to 8. So again, you don't need big shifts here. But by shifting it up to 7.5 to 8, most of that aspirin is ionized and it cannot be reabsorbed in the tubules. You'll just pee it right out. Okay? So that's the main thing we're going to be doing for those patients to try to increase that elimination. Also, by giving them bicarb, what do we do to the serum pH? Keep it elevated, right? So which is good because that's going to keep aspirin out of the CNS. It's going to keep it out of the tissues, and it's going to be helping the patient overall. Okay. And then once we start to get up to levels of say 70, 80, 90, that's where we got to think about dialysis. Dialysis is going to be one of the things you can use for aspirin, and that is definitive therapy that will pull off all that drug, and it's going to pull off very quickly, which is nice. And again, I remember my first day that I was on call during my fellowship. And again, this is, the, of course, the first call I get was an aspirin. And it was like in the middle of the panhandle. And somewhere where I was just like, okay, the level comes back. And it's like 70 patients, you know, uh, you know, breathing, you know, 30 times a minute. And, you know, they just they just don't look right. They just look kind of toxic. And I'm just like, okay, well, I, I know this patient is going to need aspirin. All right, they're going to need hemodialysis. And they're like, well, we don't have hemodialysis here. Oh, okay. Um, they're already giving the bicarb. They're already trying to alkalize the urine. Uh, I was like, well, and they're like, well, we could, do you want us to life flight them? And of course, I can't find my attending. He's in the bathroom. I know at the time. I was like, ah, uh, so it's kind of a hard call to make. And you feel like you're a fledgling. And any, any decision you make is probably going to get get you yelled at. It's okay. I said, ah, uh, let's do it. Fortunately, that was the right answer. I didn't get yelled at too bad. But yeah, yeah, that's no problem. That's fine. Because, I mean, that's a big decision, right? Because, again, it's logistically a big deal. It's a very expensive thing to do. But it was the right thing to do for that patient. So I got a life flighted over to a center. We had dialysis available. Got the dialysis catheter placed. Pulled that stuff off, and she did fine. Right? So, again, um, sometimes you think about logistically what you can do where you're working at. Okay. Um, I got some more time. So uh, anticholinergic toxicity. Again, this is mainly referring to which specific cholinergic receptors? Muscarinic, right? Okay, so anti-muscarinic drugs, what are some examples? Talked about a ton of them. Scopolamine patches fit in that category. What else? All of your bell belladonna alkaloids, right? What else? TCAs. You have your allergies. You have runny nose. What are you going to take? Antihistamines, right? First generation antihistamines fall in this category. Ton of, ton of different drugs here, right? All have anticholinergic properties. Again, we know the mnemonic. We already covered that, so I'm not going to make you say it again. But also think about plant sources as well, right? Sometimes if you have a patient who, a kid or something, may have been going around the garden, got into a plant, you don't know what it is. Again, those are always the worst cases. I'll have like someone who brings their kid into the ER and they bring the plant with them. They're like, here, identify this. And I'm like, ooh. It's all shriveled up and it's like someone's been sitting on it in the car and just like, ooh. It doesn't really matter, right? Because, again, I can base it off what I'm seeing in the patient. If they present anticholinergic, you treat it like an anticholinergic, right? Um, so it's one of those things that can be a little difficult when they say, what kind of plant is this? And like, I'm not a botanist. Like, I'm, I don't know. Um, so anyway, so what are we going to do for these patients here? Um, what are some things we can do for them? So, again, how are they going to present being altered? They can be a little sleepy, but more often than not, they're going to be agitated. They can be very anxious, maybe hallucinating. They're typically going to be tachycardic, maybe a little hypertensive. What can I do for those patients? They're getting a little violent. They're getting a little antsy, trying to swing at people. You know, sedate them, right? What are the best drugs to sedate these patients? Something like benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are going to be the safest drug for these patients because it's not going to really monkey with the, the clinical picture. If I give them something like Haldol, Haldol, guess what? It has some anticholinergic properties. It's not good. However, people, when they see an agitated patient like that, it's one of the first drugs they jump to, right, or Geodon or something like that. Um, so we like just straight benzos if you can because they're very clean acting in terms of uh, their mechanism, and it's very good at sedating these patients. Sometimes you need huge doses, though, right? I talked about that kid that needed 14 milligrams of Ativan just to get him to sleep, right? He's still fasciculating. He's still moving around. He's at least asleep. Um, and so that's the best thing. Also for seizures, the go-to is benzos as well, right? If that failed, what could I use? 
Richards are a good backup, and then if that's not working, what else could I use? Yeah, Propofol is a good one. Yeah, actually, actually, ketamine might actually make things a little bit worse because you know it could make them more tachycardic, more hypertensive. So we'd probably stay away from that one. It doesn't really have any anti-seizure properties, but Propofol is a really good option for those patients, right? It, assuming they're failing everything else. Now, what can I do to fix the ultimate problem, right? You're blocking all those muscarinic receptors. What can I do to reverse that? Give them more acetylcholine? Why well, can't I don't have like a vial of acetylcholine to give them? Yeah, well, I can I can inhibit what enzyme? Acetylcholine esterase, right? By inhibiting that enzyme, you'll increase levels of acetylcholine. They'll kick that jimson weed or that diphenhydramine or the amitriptyline off the receptor, and thus will restore normal function of those muscarinic receptors. Okay. Now, again, you have to be careful because what's the side effects of giving an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor? Yeah, you cause the opposite effect. You cause a cholinergic side effect. So you can see the dumbbells develop there, right? So that's the thing you have to consider. You don't want to make sure you give it too quickly. You don't want to slam them with it, but you can give it slowly. You should help to kind of reverse those effects. Those are typically, we're going to give, and again, what's the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor we're going to talk about here? Physostigmine. Yeah, if you see stigmine, you can think acetylcholinesterase inhibitor is like neostigmine, peridostigmine. Physostigmine is the main one we're going to talk about here. If you look at the brand name for it, it's called antelirium. We used to use it for patients presenting with altered mental status anyway, because very frequently they were pre you know, presenting after being exposed to one of these anticholinergics. So um, be careful with the adverse effects of giving acetylcholinesterase inhibitor because they turn into a cholinergic crisis potentially. Okay, And that's really only going to be for refractory patients if they are not responding to the benzos, they're still seizing, or they are an SVT or any kind of dysrhythmia. That's when we can bust out the physostigmine. Okay. Again, labs are not going to be super useful for us here, but certainly get an EKG, certainly be using all the normal um, laboratory techniques. Um, GI decontamination is the same here. Uh, now, again, what's the time frame if I have a patient who ate a bunch of Jimson weed? Two hours, right? Because remember, anticholinergics will slow down the GI tract. So I got two hours I could use that charcoal potentially. And again, listen to the bowel sounds. It'll kind of tell you uh, if they're diminished or not. And they'll say, okay, well, maybe it's within an hour and a half. Let's go ahead and do it, right? Um, as mentioned, for benzos are going to be for seizure agitation. And the physostigmine is going to be technically the antidote. Again, I'll tell you how many times I've probably seen physostigmine used, maybe three, four times, like in my, my somewhat limited years here on, on planet Earth. It's not used commonly. Like, it has a bit of a negative stigma associated with it, so you don't see it frequently. Benzos, though, can't go wrong with those, okay? You know what the max dose of, max dose of benzos you can give is? Whenever they stop breathing, right? You can keep giving more, okay? And worst case scenario, we intubate them, we can breathe for them, we can get more benzos, okay? <laughs> so those are things to consider. Usually, though, if they fail two or three doses, that's when you start to use your backups, like your propofol, your barbs, whatever you got to use, okay? Okay, let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then continue on with more toxicology. <laughs> All right, let's get back to it. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, uh, so up next we have our cardiovascular agents. Uh, quite a few here, uh, probably far and away with the most common ones you're going to run into are going to be your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, uh, and then you'll see, you know, digoxin every once in a while, clonidine, some of the nitrites, things like that. But again, going back to the mechanism, you'll know kind of how those patients should be presenting. So if you had to expect, say, someone who had taken, say, too much MDOR, right, the uh, isosorbide mononitrate, how might you expect a person to present, vital signs-wise? So blood pressure would be high or low? Probably low, right, because it's causing vasodilation. Heart rate should be up or down. It's probably tachycardic, right, because, again, the heart's trying to compensate for that decrease in SVR. So you expect them to be tachycardic, hypotensive. That would make sense. Uh, how about a beta blocking agent, though? What would you expect to see there? Blood pressure up or down? Down, right, and beta, uh, heart rate? Down as well, okay. How about a – how about dotizum? Hypotensive heart rate should be down as well, right? So again, not everything is going to present bradycardia hypotensive. Sometimes you can see, um, you know, something that may look atypical, but if you know the mechanism for the drug, it'll make a lot more sense, right? Amlodipine would present a little bit more hypotensive tachycardic, similar to a nitrate. Okay. Now again, what if I had someone who say was on a beta blocker chronically, and say for instance they ran out of their medication and they're having a withdrawal effect? What would you expect to see? We've got hypertension, heart rate might be up. So, again, think about withdrawal effects as well. It's really nasty with clonidine, right? You have someone who's on clonidine long term, they come off of that. That can actually be really, really bad in terms of um, increases in blood pressure and heart rate, um, given the fact that, you know, uh, looking at receptor upregulation and things like that. Okay. So, just things to keep in mind. Now, looking at digoxin toxicity, um, remember we talked about toxicity you can normally find with digoxin include what are kind of the, the um, sort of unique things you can see with digoxin? Hmm? 
It's not blue vision. It's yeah. So they get yellow, kind of greenish vision. What do you call that? Xan. Thopsia, as anthopsia. Um, and then uh, also get the halos around lights and things like that. So it's very prototypical of the jocks when their levels get too high. Uh, and again, this is a good one because we can get levels for it. And we can also end up um, getting, uh, there's an antidote for this as well. Right? We talked about it before uh, way back in the day. But there's things you want to think about. A lot of GI uh, upset you can see with digoxin as well. And then the biggest thing, though, is cardiovascularly speaking, you can really see any dysrhythmia as possible. Okay? Um, typically, you're going to see bradycardia, maybe some first degree heart block. You see a lot of PVCs, um, but really any dysrhythmia can develop here, ventricular, atrial, et cetera. Um, and in fact, there's some things you can find um, that are really only seen with digoxin, right? Certain types of um, Sort of have a dysrhythmia. So, um, but just know that the more common things you're going to find are going to be bradycardia and those PVCs you're going to be finding there. Okay. And again, this is giving you a sign that, hey, some that heart's aggravated here, especially with those PVCs. They're going to be at risk of developing those dysrhythmias. Those are the things we have to worry about. Okay. Now, does anyone remember how does digoxin actually work? Okay. It blocks that sodium potassium pump, right? And so, if you had to guess, what electrolyte shift might you see because of that? Hmm? Potassium B, high or low? Be high, right? So hyperkalemia is what you're going to see with digoxin. That is important because how is digoxin cleared? Well, it's cleared renally. So if you have a renal patient, their potassium is probably going to be what already? Yeah, anyway, right? So again, sometimes the hyperkalemia is also aggravating the, the, the arrhythmias as well. So those are kind of two competing things you have to think about. So if you see a patient who is on digoxin or having toxicity, check the potassium as well. You got to look at that and make sure it's not too elevated. Most of the time it's going to be either from the renal failure they may have uh, along with it, or it could be just due to the, the, the digoxin itself. So those are things to know. Um, but again, anytime we're having a hypotension, how are we going to manage that? In fluids? How much? Hmm? Those are maintenance fluid rates, right? First you want to get them filled back up, right? To fill the tank, we want to give a bolus dose. How much are we going to give? 20 per kilo is a good starting rate, right? For most adults, that's one to two liters, okay? Be careful, though, if they have CHF, if they have uh, um, uh, renal failure, they may be kind of fluid overloaded already, so you have to consider kind of what the uh, status is. You may, be, you, want, may you want to be a little bit more cautious, maybe starting with the 500, working your way up to a liter, okay? So these are things you want to consider. Um, but if that is not working, even though you feel like you've got the vasculature fully uh, filled back up, what can you do then? And we move on to pressures, right? Things like norepinephrine can be useful here, things like dopamine, things like potentially epinephrine, but those are the things you want to think about. What's kind of the order of things I want to initiate in order to get this blood pressure back up? Okay, that's the biggest thing. Um, now, with digoxin, the nice thing here is we have a nice antidote for it. This is where we have the digibind or the digifab, if you ever see that. What type of drug is that? It's a digifab. Monoclonal antibody, right? Actually, it's uh, the FAB portion of the antibody. They've chopped off the FC portion of it to make it less antigenic. Anyone remember what animal it comes from? It actually comes from sheep. Yeah, it comes from ovine sources. So they actually hyperimmunize sheep against the digoxin, take those antibodies out, cut off the FC portion so we don't have a reaction to it. It's very, very highly specific for binding up digoxin. And then you can almost see the effects go away immediately, which is great. So we'll have a patient who will present in renal failure, was taking the same dose of digoxin, but now they're not clearing it as well. Level comes back elevated. Anyone remember what a normal level of digoxin is? Like 0.8 to 1.2 is considered therapeutic. So you'll see patients come in like 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, you know, they're hypotensive. They have a significant heart block. Get the digifab, and within a couple minutes, they're back to, to normal hemodynamic status. You take them off the pressors, it goes away very quickly. So that's a benefit of, of digoxin toxicity is we can reverse it very easily. However, if you're in somewhere where they don't carry enough of it or if you're in a place where they may not have it at all, that's a concern, right? You have to think about where can we get them to to, to, to get that back on board. So um, there's also some plants uh, that can also have uh, digoxin toxin like compounds in them. Anyone know some plants that has them? So foxglove is one. A big one you'll see here, especially if you're driving on the interstate or in like 417 or something, you see them on the, the, the highways or the, the, the medians. Oleanders are another big one, right? So, so we have a ton of oleanders here in Florida. So like yellow, white oleanders, things like that. They actually contain digoxin-like compounds. So if a child were to eat some of that or an animal or a person were to eat some of that, guess what? They can get just as toxic off of this. And guess what? Digibine will still work for that, which is nice. The dosing changes a little bit, but um, that's going to be the antidote for this. Okay. All right. For beta blockers, again, you should expect to see um, bradycardia and hypotension being the, obviously the most common things you're going to see with that. Um, you may see some CNS manifestations, especially with some lipophilic ones like propranolol, but that's not going to be as common. More often than not, they're more kind of uh, with a dep depressed mental status due to kind of underperfusion of the CNS. It's more commonly. And then some other things you may see potentially include things like bronchospasm, 
that's going to be seen with uh, which kind of data blockers. The non-selective beta blockers, right? Remember N through Z? We all have your non-selective beta blockers like propranolol, atoprolol, aspetolol are probably less likely to cause that. Other things include hypoglycemia. Now, why might you expect to see hypoglycemia with a beta blocker? Well, it masks the signs of hypoglycemia, so that's an important thing. What does it do specifically? Where do we produce new glucose typically? In the liver. If part of that is stimulated by adrenergic receptors, the beta receptors specifically. So by blocking that, you can actually develop hypoglycemia. Sometimes when a patient presents hypotensive, or hypotensive and bradycardic, I don't know what substance they might have been exposed to. By looking at the blood sugar, sometimes that can help me out. And if I see that the blood sugar is running low, that may lead me to think this is more like a beta blocker. Then it would be something else like, say, clonidine or a calcium channel blocker. That's one thing we could potentially use to try to determine what we're dealing with. Now, as far as um, the labs go, nothing specific here. Obviously, EKG is going to be uh, of paramount importance. And in fact, if you have a patient who is, has an intentional self-harm, when should you get an EKG, just in general? That's right. Always is when you should get it because you never know what they could have been exposed to. It could have been a lot of psychotropic medications, cardiovascular medications. You never know what could be there. So if it's an intentional ingestion, I go ahead and get an EKG regardless. Okay. Anyway, what we can do, GID contamination is the same as just like anything else. So within an hour is going to be useful here. Um, and then if you need to correct any electrolyte, if you need to collect, uh, correct the glucose, go ahead and handle that. And then if they're having any seizures, now again, this would be more seen with like something like propranolol. It's very lipophilic, but not commonly. Very rarely ever, if ever see a, a seizure along with um, a beta blocker. And then uh, the thing that we can actually use as terms of antidote. So if you had to think about an antidote for a beta blocker overdose, it's going to be glucagon. And you're thinking, wait a second, what does glucagon do? Normally, that raises blood sugar, right? So, who would you normally see taking glucagon or have it available? A diabetic patient, right? Because again, they got hypoglycemia, give them glucagon. What does glucagon do in the liver? Stimulates gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, right? And raises blood sugar. Okay. Well, also, what it does. Because if you think about beta blocker toxicity, it's sitting on the beta receptors. So you can't, even though you're releasing epinephrine or epi, you can't really stimulate the heart really to increase that cardiac output. Well, what glucagon will do is actually kind of goes through a backdoor mechanism to get into the heart to increase levels of cyclic AMP. That will then increase contractility. And then it will raise the blood pressure back up as cardiac output goes up. And will then correct the heart rate. So you get a question of what is going to be the antidote for beta blocker toxicity. It's going to be glucagon. It's kind of your first line that you're going to be going to. Okay. Because yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it from that mechanistic standpoint, or at least what you normally use glucagon for, but that is what we uh, will see done, done pretty commonly. Now, calcium channel blockers, they're going to be presenting typically with hypotension. And now if it's a DHP like in lodipine, they'll probably be tachycardic. However, it's something like verapamil and they'll probably be bradycardic. However, massive amlodipine injections will present bradycardic, hypotensive, both, right? So again, sometimes it's a little bit of a mixed picture there, depending on what you're dealing with. Um, now, again, looking at, uh, say, for instance, you know, the, the sphincter tone scale things, these are probably going to be like a 9 or a 10. Like, these can be very, very dangerous, um, mainly because they have long half-lives, uh, and they can be very profoundly, um, uh, cause profound negative effects on the cardiovascular system. Anyway, what's interesting here, though, is I mentioned with beta blockers, I look for hypoglycemia. This is actually when I look for hyperglycemia, because blocking calcium influx, if you go back to your endo lectures, Calcium influx is necessary for the pancreas to release insulin. You remember that diagram we talked about, the sulfonylureas and all that kind of stuff? Well, if you block calcium influx, you're going to decrease insulin release, and blood sugar levels should go up at that point, right? So if I have a patient presents with an unknown ingestion, a hypotensive bradycardic, and I see that they're hyperglycemic, that leads me to think it's probably more likely something like a calcium channel blocker. That would be important because the treatment is going to be a little bit different, okay? Now, your logic would say, well, if I have a calcium channel blocker, what could I use to reverse that? You give them calcium, right? Try to overcome the blockade that the drugs are causing and try to get some uh, increased calcium influx. That should cause the blood pressure to go back up. should cause the, the heart rate to come back up as well. Typically, we'll find calcium chloride is going to be kind of transient. It's going to maybe be useful kind of in a pinch, but it's not really going to be our definitive therapy with this. Um, you can try things like atropine for bradycardia. You could also try atropine for beta blockers as well. Not usually that effective, uh, as I've seen. Um, and then, you know, use your pressors and fluids for the hypotension. The biggest thing that we can do for these patients, though, is going to be what we call high-dose insulin euglycemia therapy. This is a really fun one because if you ever want to give crazy doses of drugs to patients, this is a good one you're going to scare everyone on the unit. Um, basically, what we'll do is we will give up to 10 units per kilo per hour of insulin, regular insulin via IV infusion to these patients along with glucose. 
And what this does, is it also kind of acts as a backdoor mechanism to increase cyclic AMP because you're getting more glucose into the heart. You're getting more of that converted over into energy, you're getting cardiac output back up. And so again, when the nurse says, you want me to give how much insulin? And I say, yeah, go ahead and give all that. And she's like, no, my license will get taken away because I'm going to kill this patient. Like, no, 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 we're giving glucose with it. It'll be fine. What's also nice is the calcium channel blockers are blocking insulin release anyway. So again, you're going to find um, that it works out pretty nicely there. So that's a therapy we'll do occasionally um, for more treatment resistant calcium channel blocker ingestions. Yes, sir. Hyper um, high dose insulin euglycemia therapy. So you have a really high doses of insulin, regular insulin is what you're using. Because again, anytime you're giving IV infusions of insulin, you always want to use regular insulin, nothing else, not short, act, ultra short acting, not the long acting. And then we're giving glucose along with it. So that way the blood sugar should stay relatively the same, but you're giving a ton, ton of insulin to try to drive all that glucose into the cell, get more cyclic AMP produced, get more energy, get more contractility out of that heart. Okay. Now, clotting toxicity is one of the things that actually looks a lot like opioid overdose. And again, what does an opioid overdose look like? CNS depression. Dipnea, meiosis, clotting can do a lot of that same stuff too, right? Because again, it's a central sympatholytic, so it's shutting down the sympathetic nervous system from the brain down, so you're more likely to see that kind of depressed mental status. Respiratory rate usually doesn't take a hit, but certainly you're going to find bradycardia, hypotension, you also see that meiosis. And so actually what's interesting is because it looked a lot like an opioid overdose, what do they usually get on accident? Probably got Narcan. What we actually found is in some cases, Narcan actually can reverse some of these effects. Probably has something to do with some endogenous opioids that the brain releases in, in re response to clonidine, but we do know that works. And actually, one case that I had um, was a infant, they're probably like, you know, probably seven or eight months old, something like that, and the patient was coming in, they were very seen as depressed, a little hypotensive, but the kid just wasn't acting right. The parents were really worried about it. And so they called me because they said, well, maybe it's a, a drug ingestion. So I was kind of asking the history. And I was like, okay, well, what kind of drugs are in the house, you know, with, with a small kid? Obviously, that patient probably isn't on any medications, but who else is on medications? Probably the parents, right? Or if they live with grandparents and things like that. So I asked around. And uh, the dad's like, oh, well, I take a clonidine patch. I was like, oh, interesting, clonidine patch. I said, well, is there any chance the baby could have gotten the clonidine patch and ingested that? He's like, no way. The kid's not even, like, moving around that much. Like, no way. I was like, is there any other kids in the house? He's like, yeah, he's that three-year-old brother. I said, I bet this kid got fed a patch by his little brother. <laughs> the kids like to mimic activities, right? So they're like, oh, well, dad uses this for his medicine. It's good for him. I'm going to go ahead and give this to my little baby brother. And they're like, no way, couldn't have it, couldn't have it. So, okay, let's try. And so we ended up doing an arcane drip on the patient there. We were actually able to keep him a little bit more aroused. We were able to keep his blood pressure back up. And I will tell you, sure enough, two days later, get pooped out of patch. Never felt like a bigger rock star in my entire life than that. Everyone's like, you're crazy. There's no way that happened. But patches are really dangerous in kids because they still have a lot of drug in them. So whether it's a fentanyl patch, a transderm scope, a uh, clonidine, any of them are going to have a lot of drug in them. And they will slowly release the whole GI tract. Now, what could I have done to try to push that, tr that patch through that much more quickly? Could have done a whole bowel irrigation. That was tough to do in an eight-month-old, so we did not do that. We said, well, the Narcan drip is working well enough. Let's just give it time. Remember that infants usually have pretty fast GI tract times anyway, so, again, it only took uh, you know, two days or so before he was able to get it through through the system there. So, anyway, just kind of think about the clinical situation there. That's one thing to, to think about. Narcan can use it for clonidine. It doesn't always work, but it does work occasionally. Okay. As I mentioned, the withdrawal syndrome can be very severe with clonidine. I mean, you can see this with beta blockers too, but certainly worry about this. This can actually induce MI in some patients that have history of uh, cardiovascular disease, so just be aware of that. Now, how would I treat this if a patient came in and they're severely hypertensive, tachycardic, because of clonidine withdrawal? Can I give them more clonidine? I can probably do that, right? So that's one thing you could do. Other agents we could do, we could try giving something like an IV beta blocker. We could use something like nitroprusside, nitroglycerin to get the pressure down. These are all things you can consider there. But again, if they are missing clonidine, let's give them more clonidine. That will usually help to, to kind of even things back out. Okay. Okay, looking at the nitrates, um, this one you don't see too, too frequently. However, what's a drug we were recently talking about in farm that could lead to nitrate toxicity? The drug interaction is really important, say for, say, uh, more seasoned gentlemen. Gentlemen uh, for taking their social alliances. So Denethyl, right? All your phosphodesterase inhibitors, remember, all those are going to uh, uh, potentiate the effects of the nitrates. And that's why you never want to mix those two together because they leave that profound hypotension. So you get tachycardic, hypotensive, usually depressed mental status because, again, they're not perfusing the brain very well. These are all things you have to think about, right? Um, and so, again, you don't want to see these by themselves, but usually in a mixture with other medications, also causing hypotension there. The biggest thing is just going to be the orthostatic hypotension, the lightheadedness, et cetera. Now, how do you think I'd be, be able to treat this? 
fluids and pressors, right? That's really the biggest thing you can do for them because if they're vasodilated, well, let me give them some fluids to try to fill that space back up and that's still not working. Then I can use something that's a little more preferential for the vessels to try to squeeze down on there and norepi is a really good option for that. What else could I use it as, uh, say, an only an alpha constrictor? It's phenylephrine. Phenylephrine might be a good option for that as well. Maybe as a backup, if say norepi was not working uh, on its own. Okay, so that's one thing to consider there. Now, occasionally you may find that hemoglobinemia can develop from this. It's very rare to, to see that. Um, actually, one case where I have seen that before is using nitric oxide. Now, again, that's not nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is used for what? Procedural sedation, right? It's laughing gas, right? I can use that for uh, getting patient ready to soap a laceration or for a dental procedure or something. Nitric oxide can actually be used for pulmonary hypertension. I've seen this used in the medical ICUs before where we use it to try to open up those vessels in the lungs to try to perfuse a little bit better. Um, and it actually can induce methemoglobinemia in those patients as well, right? They turn blue. And anyone know what the antidote we give for that name is? Methylene blue, right? Give the blue patient the blue drug to turn them pink again. And so that's, I've seen that occasionally. Again, the biggest thing is just going to be um, you know, another thing to consider as well. If they're hypotensive, they're not perfusing the brain very well, what position can I put them in? Head down, feet up, right? It's Trendelenburg that helps to increase blood flow back to the brain. But again, fluids and pressors are going to be the big thing here. Okay. And the hemoglobin, uh, if they have a level grade, say 35 to 40, again, that's hemoglobin that's now been converted over. So that means you have that much less hemoglobin to actually supply oxygen to the brain into the body. Um, so that's why we consider once you get about 40 or so, then we're going to start to want to convert that back over and methylene blue is good for that. Okay. Um, yeah. So those are the big things uh, to consider with that one. And again, how would you determine if a patient has a met hemoglobinemia? One, well, they look blue, that's going to be a good sign. What else? Is there a lab I can get? We're going back to that lab slide. The ABG with co-oximetry will tell you that, right? It'll tell you the carbon monoxide. It'll tell you um, uh, hemoglobinemia. It'll tell you all of that good stuff, right? So I can tell what percentage it is and if I need to treat it. You guys ever seen the, the Blue Family from Kentucky? Actually, uh, it's a very interesting case. Uh, you can Google this, but there's a family in Kentucky, and, and I guess the dating pool is not um, uh, expansive. Uh, I should say. And so they tended to find love uh, where they could and, and it tended to be within the family, right? So um, they actually ended up inbreeding uh, and they developed this genetic deficiency in methemoglobin reductase. And so they all have a baseline methemoglobinemia because they don't have the enzyme to reduce it back over to hemoglobin. So they have this blue complexion because they always have a kind of a resting methemoglobin level. Uh, it's kind of interesting. So again, moral of that story, don't date where you live, right? Go outside, screen your borders a little bit there. Anyway, Continuing on, next going into the uh, antidepressants, we have our TCAs. Now, again, in terms of sphincter tone, this ranks up there with aspirin. These can be very, very dangerous. TCAs, if you remember, not only can they have anticholinergic properties, so they have all the mnemonics associated with that, but also they have alpha antagonism leading to what? They block alpha-1 receptors, causing hypotension. Yep. They can see sodium channel blockade in the heart leading to QRS prolongation and ventricular arrhythmias. And they also in, uh, will block the activities of GABA in the brain, causing seizures, right? So these are very, very dangerous drugs. And in fact, before SSRIs came about, when most of your uh, depressed patients were taking this, it was very common for them to try to commit suicide. Because remember, what was the risk uh, when you first start a patient out on an antidepressant? Increased risk for suicidality, because now that's energy, or that a little bit of akathisia, and they start to act on these thoughts that they maybe had no energy to act on before. So... These are things you really got to check the EKG. Normally, if the QRS gets prolonged greater than 100 milliseconds, we'll actually initiate uh, alkalinization therapy. And so basically what we're doing is giving sodium bicarb in D5 and trying to get the serum pH up. So this is different than what we talked about the aspirin. With aspirin, the urinary alkalinization, this is serum alkalinization. And so basically what we're trying to do is get the serum pH up to about 7.45 to 7.55. Now you think that may not sound like a whole lot because normally it's 7.35 to 7.45, trying to bump it up by point, point 0.1, right? Um, it's pretty hard to do because the body really resists big changes in pH shifts like that. And so you give a lot of bicarb, you bolus them to get them up to a range and you put them on a drip. And what that does is that one, it helps with the sodium load to try to reset those sodium channels on the heart so that we don't see the arrhythmia. Uh, but also it helps to um, increase the, um, the amount of TCA that is bound to serum proteins. And by doing that, you may have a lot less physiologically active drug, and thus you get a time for it to, to metabolize off. So that is a, kind of the definitive therapy for that, is a serum alkalinization with sodium bicarb. Okay. 
Okay. Um, again, Q, uh, anytime you have enough QRS prolongation, obviously that will, will prolong the QT as well. So that's something you can see as well. But the QRS is a big thing there. And we're going to get that sodium bicarb if they're acidotic. Because typically when they get hypotensive and they're under perfusing, guess what? You get acidotic. So again, that can help to hasten the, the um, uh, kind of demise of these patients here. But if they're acidotic, they have a QRS greater than 100 milliseconds, or if they have a ventricular arrhythmia, hypotension, we're going to go ahead and treat those patients with sodium bicarb. Okay. Um, now, again, the question is, what did their old EKG look like? Because frequently all patients who have a right bundle branch block at baseline. And so, again, you have to look at what their old one was and see if this is uh, significantly different or not. But certainly if their baseline is, like, 80 milliseconds, they come back and it's 110, that's pretty significant. I'm going to go ahead and treat for that patient. Okay. Now, if they develop a seizures, what am I going to give? You can give them benzos, right? You can give barbs if that doesn't work. You can give propofol if that doesn't work. Okay. If they get hypotensive, what do I do? Give them fluids and then pressure, right? So again, this is I keep asking the same questions over and over again, but it's important to get the basics down because these are things that are going to save you, right? Because most of the time, standard care is just going to be supportive care, as it turns out. And what's the magnesium for? Torsades, yeah. So they develop torsades. Now, it's not as common normally as VFib, VTAC is what I see with these patients. But um, in the lidocaine, I don't think I've ever actually used before, but maybe they're really refractory. The biggest thing is the bicarb. you got to get them alkalized, and that's going to be the thing that's going to save them typically. Okay. MAOI, so when, when might these be a problem? Hmm? Eat a lot of cheese. What kind of cheese? Like my Kraft Singles? No. no. My government cheddar? No. My wife told me a funny story one time. She When she went to college, with a, she had a roommate, and they were trying to be very frugal, and they decided to get this government cheese. I didn't... I'd heard the term before, but I didn't know it was an actual thing. Um, they tried to make a grilled cheese on it and put it on the pan, and it actually never melted. It retained its solid forms. Anyway, so that's not the kind of cheese we're talking about. We're talking about the bougie stuff, right? The aged cheddars and things like that. Um, stuff you get from, like, Trader Joe's, not from, like, Walmart, right? Anywho, I've been talking a lot about Walmart recently. Jeez. Um, which is funny because I do all my shopping there, so I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, so the thing with MAOIs, is you have to remember, they have a long-lasting effect. And why is that? Because they irreversibly inhibit those enzymes. So, again, even if you stop taking your MAOI, and again, what's an example of that? Phenylzine, trenylcypramine, things like that. Even if I stop taking it today, I could still have a reaction two weeks later, right? So, again, high tyramine containing foods. What other foods are included with that? Aged meats, beer, some, what else? Red wines, you know, all those things. White wines usually pretty fine. Sauerkraut, things like that, right? So again, all that really, really good food uh, is going to be uh, uh, avoided. Should be avoided because of the high tyramine content. Now, that probably is not going to be such a big deal for most of your patients because they're probably not going to be out going to fancy dinner parties and whatnot. But what is more of a clinical concern? What if I switch this person over to a different antidepressant medication? You're going to wait two weeks. What if I didn't do that and switch them the next day? Serotonin syndrome, that is a big concern, right? So I switched them, say, over to citalopram, and I did not give them that washout period, then that's where you can see that uh, occur here. Now, again, how frequently do you think you'll ever see someone on MAOI? Rarely, if ever, right? However, there are other drugs that will cause the same effect, right? What's the big one? So you're working in the ICU, and you have MRSA, but it's resistant to vancomycin, and so now you have VRSA. Linazolid, right? Remember, that has some MAOI-inhibiting properties there. What about if the patient has Parkinson's? So allegedly, remember that one? That was a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. That can cause a reaction too. So again, just because you don't see these specific ones for depression anymore doesn't mean you won't, may not run into drugs that have similar activities. So that's why we kind of still mention it here. Again, how could you determine someone has serotonin syndrome? There's kind of four cardinal signs and symptoms we we're looking for. Usually hyperthermia. What else? Muscular rigidity. Typically in the lower limbs, you'll see kind of induced clonus. What else? Alter mental status and hemodynamic instability, right? So maybe hypertensive, hypotensive, bradycardic, tachycardic. So really, if you have all four of those in the presence of serotonergic drugs like SSRIs, MAOIs, TCAs, all those can lead you to think, okay, I have serotonin syndrome. Now, do you remember how we treated that? Oxygen. Sure, it's are hypoxic. That's a good idea. So remember, um, if they have the severe muscular rigidity and they're developing rhabdo, what do I use? Antrolene occasionally. Um, sometimes I can use ciproheptidine that has anti serotonergic properties. Again, most of the time I'm just going to give them benzos. I'm going to cool them off. That's usually going to be good enough for most patients until the drugs kind of dissipate. 
Okay. Um, and again, supportive care is going to be the biggest thing here, but if, if they do develop serotonin syndrome, cool them down, get in the benzos. That's going to be the best standard therapy for them. Ciproptidine occasionally. Okay. Okay. Uh, getting into iron. Who might be at risk for iron toxicity? If you go to like Gold's Gym or something. Overdose on some iron, man. Bruh. No. Um, typically, kids can potentially get it. This actually used to be one of the biggest... Um, uh, accidental deaths in children back before we changed the packaging for a lot of iron products. Now they have those kind of uh, little packages you have to kind of pop ones out individually. But think about pregnant women or women who may be uh, on prenatal vitamins. Those are the people at biggest risk for iron toxicity here. And again, what's the biggest toxicity you can expect to see with iron? Kind of the most common thing you run into. A patient just taking iron normally. Constipation, but also... GI upset, or I think I have a lot of GI upset, abdominal cramping, complaint of vomiting. The same thing happens here, it's just more severe. And in fact, if a patient, if I got a call to the poison center and said, oh no, I think my little boy got into, my little girl got into um, too much iron, and I said, well, how are they doing? You know, it's been an hour, how, how they, oh, they're asymptomatic, no problems. They probably actually didn't get that much iron, right? Because again, that's almost ubiquitous that they're going to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea associated with this. And so that's one of the big things we're looking for, okay? Um, and in fact, we can base off the milligram per kilogram amount. Usually if it's more than 20, they're probably going to get sick from that standpoint. Now, again, the important thing to note here as well, this is elemental iron content. So to give you an example, ferrous sulfate normally comes as a 325 milligram tablet. That's 325 milligrams of ferrous sulfate. That's not the elemental iron content. It's actually 65 milligrams of elemental iron. So when you look at the packaging, make sure you look to see if it's elemental or not, or if you need to, do the conversion. I'm not going to go into that outside of our scope, but just know that's a concern. So once you get the elemental iron content down, then you have to consider how much they actually got. One of the useful things here is because they are vomiting, I have to take into account, well, how much do they throw up, right? So again, if I see a bunch of tablets in the vomit, then I can subtract that from my total amount, and it may lead me to uh, make different decisions on treatment here. But typically, when they get above 60 mg per kilo, that's when they're going to really develop significant, significant toxicity from iron. This is another really dangerous one you have to be careful of. So what happens with patients? Typically, it comes in several stages. And initially, uh, when a patient ingests a lot of iron, they're going to have a lot of GI upset. And again, this may be a very nonspecific sort of complaint. So I'll give you an example of a case where a young lady was arguing with her boyfriend, and she got very upset and decided to take a whole bunch of her prenatal vitamins. So you ingest a ton of iron tablets, right? So she develops this nausea vomiting really early on, within an hour or two. And so she goes to the ER, and the ER says, what are you here for? And she says, oh, I'm, I'm vomiting. So what do you think she gets sent to? Young, healthy individual, nausea vomiting? She gets into the fast track, right? Not alluding to the fact that she'd taken an overdose. So she goes over there and she says, you know, the doc's like, oh, what happened? And um, it was a resident at the time. And, and she was like, oh, well, you know, I might have taken an extra vitamin or two. Again, history being in, inaccurate. Um, and so she said, okay, well, here's some Zofran. She felt better. Sent him on home. She was moving into the second phase of iron toxicity. We call this the calm before the storm because basically what's happening is in the background, Iron's causing that uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. And what's going to happen is, is they're going to become very acidotic, very hypotensive very quickly. But for this next 12 hours or so, they're going to look pretty good. Like they're going to look okay. So um, patient feeling better, got sent home, and then got back to the to her boyfriend. And he's like, you need to tell him what you actually did. Like, this is going to be really bad. He had a feeling. And so she gets sent back in. By the time she got back in, she was in phase three. And this is where she got extremely acidotic, hypotensive. I'm talking like pH of 6, 9, um, you know, blood pressure in the you know 50s over 30s. Like she was very, very, very sick. And so what do we do for that? You want to know? Defroxamine is what we're going to do. It's called chelation therapy, right? We're going to give something that will bind up that iron. And then we'll make it not physiologically active. And then they can just get rid of it either through the urine, uh, most likely through the urine. And so this is the thing to keep in mind is that just because someone has an iron overdose and they look okay does not mean that they are okay, right? It could be just mean they're in that second phase and that good things could get a lot worse. And so what we're going to do is be monitoring iron levels. And so what you're going to find is that the iron levels can be very useful to tell you kind of, especially with trending, to see where you're going and determine if you need to actually give antidotal therapy or not, as the case may be. Um, but again, there's five stages. Usually the fifth stage is when they've recovered uh, and they're kind of going along their way. Hopefully your patient actually gets to that point, though, right? Okay. So as I mentioned, the first six hours or so is when you're going to see mostly the abdominal stuff. Again, you may actually see GI bleeding associated with this because iron can be very corrosive to the GI tract. Um, so just be aware if you see that hematemesis, uh, that is going to be pretty consistent with uh, severe iron ingestions, right? Um, when they, they go into that latent phase. Another term for this is the quiescent phase. If you ever hear that, that's what it's referring to. Again, they look good. 
in like the next second 12 hour sort of mark here. Uh, but in the meantime, they're developing this metabolic acidosis in the background. Okay, the body can compensate for a little bit, but eventually it's going to get overwhelmed and they go straight into phase three here. So at this point, um, they're going to be hypotensive, acidotic, potentially a risk for seizures, hypoglycemia, all kinds of bad stuff happening here is where antidural therapy needs to get on board because if not, the patient's not going to make it. And then you can't have some hepatic um, problems that come up uh, after this is usually if the patient makes it through stage three. Uh, and then once they kind of survive this, then they're kind of um, left with some of the kind of lingering GI effects. And in fact, sometimes you can actually have um, uh, actual strictures that occur from the iron because it's so corrosive, all that GI tissue gets replaced by scar tissue. And that can lead to lots of big issues in terms of um, can I even swallow food anymore? Some patients have to go on TPN permanently after this. It can be really bad from that standpoint. So what do we do? Um, you got to make sure you get your iron levels, um, preferably every Q2 hours, if it's going to be an intentional ingestion to see where it's trending. And so typically what we're going to find is that once you start to get above levels, let's say 350, 500 micrograms per ml, that's where you really need to start um, treating this. Is when you need to start looking at antidotal therapy with the um, uh, deferoxamine. Lactic acid could also be very useful in determining kind of what the acid based status is of the patient. ABGs are useful here as well. That's all good. Um, Obviously, the patient maybe of childbearing potential. What else do you want to get? Pregnancy, right? So again, anytime you have a young lady who, uh, or any lady who might be of childbearing potential, go ahead and get a UCG to make sure you can rule that out, right? Because oftentimes, if we're debating between mom dying or giving the antidote, we're always going to go with giving the antidote because if there's no mom, there's probably no baby, right? Uh, but it's a good point of information to know. We need to know if they're, they're pregnant or not. Now, as I mentioned, what could we do? Could we get an X-ray? Yeah, we could. But what did I say about x-rays if they're negative? They don't rule anything out. So if they're positive, that's great. If I see a bunch of iron tablets on there, I'm like, great, I got confirmation. This is it. If not, I can't necessarily rule it out. That's why the iron levels need to be acquired. This resident in the first place never got the iron levels. Otherwise, they would have seen it was high. It would have known that, hey, this patient is a lot more, probably going to be more sick than what they are right now. Right. So anyway, um, decontamination is not going to be great because remember, what did charcoal not work for? Hmm? Doesn't work for metals. What else does it not work for? Alcohols, hydrocarbons. Those are the big ones. Corrosives, you also don't want to use it for mainly for, because you don't want it to cause them to vomit. But those are the big things is that GID contamination is not going to be super useful here, but charcoal will not work with this. Now, had it been a multiple ingestion, say they took Tylenol and aspirin or Tylenol and, um, and iron, you could use charcoal in that case because it will bind up the Tylenol right, or the aspirin or whatever else they co-ingest with that. That's the thing to know. Um, but the mainstay is going to be chelation with deferoxamine. It'll bind up the iron and then we'll prevent it from interacting with the cells and that way you kind of alleviate a lot of the effects here. And it works pretty well. You'll definitely see the blood pressure come back up. The pH isn't going to resolve. A uh, very nice working drug. Uh, we give it a continuous infusion, um, usually for say, I think that patient may have been on six, 12 hours and then they were done. We could take it off and they were fine at that, after that point. So um, the other big thing to know, if you ever see um, uh, something called a vin rosé urine, what color is that, do you think? Vin Rosé. No, no wine fans out there? It's kind of pinkish, right? It kind of has a, a light pink sort of coloration. If you see that, that is something you'll see normally with deferoxamine in lead, I'm sorry, uh, iron uh, ingesting patients, right? Basically, that chelation, that deferoxamine causes, it turns into uh, desferioxamine, the two to combine together, and it's red. So you may actually see a change in the patient's urine, which if you saw the urine turn kind of a pink reddish color, what would you naturally assume? or it's probably hematuria, but actually this case is not. It's actually the drug doing its thing, getting rid of that extra iron. So that's a little, little side point there. Okay, up next we have lead toxicity. Now what's a normal lead level in patients? Zero. This is a non-naturally occurring substance in our body. We want to get rid of it. Who is at risk for lead toxicity? Why little kids? Hmm? They paint off the walls. What else do they do? The toys are made of lead. The toys may be made of lead. Maybe they're getting them from uh, maybe some subpar. Maybe they got them from Walmart. Who could say? I don't know. <laughs> I don't screen all their. Actually, I just got my kid a monster truck from there. So I should probably go check that out. Anyway, um, all right. So think about lead contaminated toys. Uh, think about gunshot victims who maybe have uh, have retained uh, lead particulate. Um, the big thing though is that what does lead look like to the body? What ion? Looks like calcium actually. And so what you find is it, um, and where, where might you find like houses with a lot of lead in them? Usually like brand new houses. If you go to a new development by Dr. Horton, it's DR Horton, just kidding. 
Um, no, so if you go to like uh, older cities, the inner city, things like that, where they're more likely to have lead exposure, also those kids might be more likely to be malnourished, right? They may not be getting enough calcium, vitamin D in their diet. So when the body gets exposed to lead, it says, hey, this looks a lot like calcium. Let's start to incorporate this into the bones. What's a way you can actually determine if a kid's been exposed to lead? We can check their x-rays and they actually can have lead lines along some of the long bones. You can actually see that where the lead's been preferentially taken up and it's more radio opaque than the, the calcium is. So these are things to think about. I always want to make sure that um, whenever you have someone who may be exposed to lead, what's the first thing you do to them? Get them out of the exposure, right? So again, whether it's contaminated water, whether it's a home, anything like that, you got to get them out of the exposure. If they're lead-covered toys, get rid of the toys, right? Uh, that's the biggest thing to eliminate further exposure. And we'll talk about chelation therapy in a little bit, but that's really the biggest thing you can do for them, okay? And also make sure they have good calcium intake because, again, we want to make sure that the, the bones are not going to be holding on to this lead because otherwise the half-life is going to be a really long time, years and years and years, because uh, they're not going to be able to get rid of it very easily, okay? So... Nowadays, most of the homes are not going to have that. And actually, the, the biggest thing you're going to see is not necessarily kids eating lead paint chips. More often, the problem is, is um, looking at like door jams and window seals where you're going to have constant friction on there. And that will actually aerosolize some of the lead particles. And then when you breathe it in, it has much better bioavailability. So that's oftentimes a concern is them inhaling it, not necessarily them eating paint chips, right? For kids that like pike gun and things like that. So anyway, what's the problem with lead? Like, why do I care about lead in the body? A lot of CNS issues, especially for a young developing mind, right? We definitely know that the higher the lead levels are, the lower your IQ is going to be, the worse you're going to perform in school, the worse off you're going to be, right? So because of that, we want to make sure we're getting lead out of these um, uh, patients again, uh, as best we can. And so we're going to find that at some point, though, um, therapy gets less and less effective the lower your level is. Now, if you come back and your level is extremely high, chelation therapy works great for that. But by the time you're like really low levels, like 5 or 10, something like that, chelation therapy is not going to do a whole lot of good for you. That's why you need to get them out of the exposure if possible. Okay. Actually, an interesting uh, case I had one time was uh, a family who was uh, – this is actually – you know, working in, in Jacksonville, Duval County, we didn't get a lot of lead exposures. Um, actually, there's a big fire that happened in, in Jacksonville that actually eliminated a lot of the buildings that may have used lead paint at the time. But um, we actually had a family who moved out into the country. They had dug a new well, and the well got contaminated with lead. And it was interesting because they had the mom, the dad, who were probably like in their late 20s, early 30s, and then you had three kids. You had an a infant, probably like six months old. Um, you had like a two-year-old and a five-year-old. It was interesting. You could tell based off of the fact that the ones who had the more developing bones, they actually had higher lead levels based on the same relatively same exposure. So the infant had the highest levels out of the bunch because they were the ones actually developing, trying to intake all the calcium. Okay. So again, the younger you are, the more likely you are to uptake that based off diet and, and some other things there as well. And again, for adult patients who have already full developed bones, the CNS is pretty well developed. Lead's going to be less of a problem until you get to really high, high levels. Okay. We actually had some patients. Another uh, interesting uh, lead exposure is that lead paint is actually very durable. And so a lot of the bridges in Jacksonville, if you don't know where the city of seven bridges, um, one time they were uh, having some workers trying to sandblast off the paint off one of the bridges and then reapply a new paint. They weren't using good respiratory protection, actually got lead levels that way. Right. So again, another kind of occupational exposure there. Anywho, um, so anyone anyway, want to know what the therapy we're going to use for these patients is? Hmm? EDTA is one. What else? Uh, that's probably not the most common one you're going to see unless you have a patient who has um, you know, pretty significant um, high levels, if they're having any kind of encephalopathy, anything like that. Uh, we're going to find that suction is probably going to be the more common one we're going to be uh, running into here, right? Um, let's see what we can find here. Again, just like looking at some, some lead lines you can see in the, um, the uh, gingiva here. Um, but again, the worst thing we're worried about is really the severe CNS toxicity where they can develop cerebral edema and whatnot. Um, as I mentioned, getting a blood lead level is really important here. Anything above 10 is considered abnormal. Really, anything above zero is considered abnormal. But these are things we're going to start to monitor for, consider getting the health department involved to try to get them away from the exposures there. Uh, but we're going to find that uh, succimer or DMSA is going to be the most common thing that most patients are going to get put on. It's nice because it's an oral therapy uh, that we can use for them, and that will um, be used to help try to get the levels down. Now, typically what you're going to find is because the lead likes to go into the bones and likes to partition out the tissue, people will be on recurrent courses of the drug. They'll go on it for a couple of weeks, and they'll come off of it. And then as the lead leaches out, then you put them back on it, get rid of that lead, and then kind of do the same thing over and over again until they get down to reasonable levels. Okay. Kind of funny here. All right, in the case, if you have a patient who say, for instance, like, uh, say, uh, ingested lead paint chips or they say ingested a, say a bullet or something like that, you could use whole bowel irrigation to flush that out. Because, again, will this bind to charcoal? 
No, it will not do that, right? Um, and as I mentioned, chelation therapy should be used, especially if you start to consider very high levels or any kind of encephalopathy. That's where we're going to start to initiate that. Let's see if I can find it. Of course, I didn't put it on there. So anyway, so the antidotes were on there are going to be DMSA or succimer is the most common thing you're going to run into. And then you might have mentioned EDTA. Uh, there's another one called British anti lewisite or BAL. It's also another common one there. But again, just know no lead level is sorry, no lead level is normal. And you gotta get them out of that exposure. Make sure they have good calcium intake. Otherwise, they're just gonna hold on to that lead. Okay. Uh, what can I do for benzos? What's my antidote for benzos? Flamazinol or mazicon. Do I do it very frequently? No. Why not? All right. You worry about withdrawal seizures, but in which patients specifically? People are chronically on benzodiazepines. Now, will flamazinol work on anything else? Nope, only for benzodiazepines, right? So it doesn't work for alcohol, it does not work for bar barbiturates, it does not work for propofol, just for benzodiazepines. Now, who might be some good patients that could receive flumazenil? Children, okay. Maybe children who are not on benzos chronically. You do see that occasionally, right? They have seizure disorders, they may be on clonazepam, uh, clobazam, they may be on those drugs chronically. Those are ones I would definitely not want to give flumazenil to. Who else? It's a good case for iatrogenic exposures, right? So if you as a provider give them too much benzos or you want them to recover a little faster, they may also be another good candidate for flumazenil, okay? You guys ever heard of the roofies before? It's actually an old school drug we don't really use anymore. It's called flunitrazepam. But again, you kind of lump them all in the same category in terms of benzos. How, how would a benzo intoxicated person present? Yeah, they're drunk, basically, right? So, and the same thing's happening, right? They're enhancing GABA effect. You're expecting them to be very CNS depressed. Now, if with an oral benzo ingestion, do they ever take a big hit on their respiratory drive? Actually, they don't. So, actually, the therapeutic index for benzos is great because uh, the only way you can die from a pure benzo overdose is if you get hit with the truck that's delivering it to your house, mm -hmm. right? So, really, really safe from that standpoint. However, what do people normally take along with benzos? Alcohol opioids, right, all kinds of bad stuff. In fact, some people will do this on purpose, get some synergy. I knew one person in uh, back in the college days who was like, oh, well, it's a lot cheaper if I just take half a Xanax with my cocktail and then I'm done for the night. Okay, um, maybe not do that. That sounds safer, but okay. <laughs> it was a bit of a buzzkill back in the day, if you can't tell. But um, just know that, again, these are synergistic effects you're going to see, and very frequently they're co-ingestion. So normally opioids, usually alcohol, usually muscle relaxants are all going to be mixed in with benzos, and then give you a very unclear sort of picture there as far as what you're dealing with. Now, again, Narcan can be given with much more impunity. Flumazenil, generally no. In fact, I can probably count on one hand the times I've actually given it to a patient where they didn't need any of the contraindications. Because right? most of the time they can just sleep it off, and they don't have to worry about it, uh, reversing it. Okay. Now, do benzodiazepines come up on a urine drug screen? They actually do, yeah. So that's something you routinely screen for, and that is usually pretty good. If they show up benzo positive, chances are they probably actually had, uh, had exposure to a benzo, right? Uh, for opioids, how are those patients going to present? Seeing a suppress. What about respiratory drive? This is a big one. Respiratory is going to be taking a hit, right? So again, this is a big difference between these and benzos, is that respiratory drive is the biggest concern. Meiosis, you can see there. But remember, sometimes drugs will present atypically. Tramadol can have seizures, right? You can see uh, serotonin syndrome with uh, tramadol or, or meparidine, right? So sometimes they're atypical things, but normally they will present very sleepy, uh, respiratory depressed, sometimes meiosis, sometimes not, right? And how do we reverse it? Narcan, right? And just remember that uh, oftentimes the drug's half-life will outlast the Narcan, so what do I need to do? You give them repeated doses or... You can do a drip, right? You can do a continuous infusion of naloxone, and sometimes we'll do that for two, three days sometimes if I have someone who's a methadone intoxicated potentially, right? And that way, again, it keeps them breathing, keeps the respiratory drive up. Um, again, they can sleep it off for the most part. You don't need them wide awake. Uh, but again, withdrawal is a concern there. There's actually been some cases where people have tried to use nebulized naloxone. This is actually kind of interesting because the patient can self-titrate their own dose. So if you imagine putting uh, naloxone into a nebulizer cup, put a mask on the patient, they'll passively start to breathe it in. What happens when they wake up? Sort of wake up a little bit. It's like, oh, get this thing off me. They'll pull it off. And as they resedate, you put the mask back on them, guess what? Just wake up a little bit. So you kind of keep them in this nice little range there where they can uh, basically are self-titrating their dose and they shouldn't really hit the withdrawal period, uh, which is good. So I've seen some people try to do that before. Um, but again, look at other co-ingestions like ethanol, look for Tylenol, look for all these things that are very common to see along with your opioids, right? And anytime you have someone who's abusing things like heroin, 
you have to be really careful because you have no idea what else is in there, right? Could be cocaine, could be um, could be fentanyl, could be all kinds of things that are mixed in there. We just don't know what it is, okay? You're looking at hallucinogens. A lot of things fit into this category. You have things like LSD. We have anyone know where you find mescaline? Actually, out west, usually it's actually found in peyote. Uh, it's a cactus that has some psychogenic properties to it. Um, psilocybin containing mushrooms, like magic mushrooms, uh, morning glory seeds, nutmeg. Anyone know you can actually get high off nutmeg? Don't try it. It's not good. Well, all I've heard, it's a very, very harsh kind of high. But again, when kids have too much time and not enough sense, stuff like this happens, right? Fortunately, I haven't seen nutmeg challenges yet, but you remember like the cinnamon challenge? People are like, getting like really bad like respiratory uh, issues, uh, pneumonitis after an accident inhaling. All stuff, similar dumb stuff happens here, right? Um, how about toads? Anyone know you can actually lick toads in order to get high, right? Not all toads, and I would not recommend finding a random toad out here, but there are certain types of toads that can actually um, contain similar components to the magic mushrooms, which is very interesting, I think, from a, an evolutionary standpoint, that you can have a frog and a mushroom producing very similar compounds. Anyway, how do these patients present, you think? Maybe some mydriasis typically, right? So a lot of you're going to find a lot of serotonin activity here is what you're going to find. They get mydriatic. You're typically going to find that cardiovascularly, maybe a little tachycardic, maybe a little hypertensive, but normally not too many issues there. Um, but hallucinations are really the biggest thing. Now, patients who are doing LSD, they're having a good time with it. Are they going to show up in the ER? No, they're doing fine, right? However, so people have the bad trips, right? So again, they can uh, develop severe um, dysphoria, severe hallucinations and things like that. And that's very frequently why they'll show up in the ER. And then how would I manage those, do you think? Yeah, you give them some benzos, right? You try to put them in a calm, cool environment, right? But again, if you're in a busy ER, is there any such places? Negative, right? So again, you're going to give them some benzos, calm down that way. And that's really the best thing for them. Sometimes you'll see seizures, not commonly, but again, benzos will be able to, to, to be useful for that. Um, and again, um, sometimes actually some of the things you have to think about atypical sort of routes of administration. So has anyone ever seen the movie SLC Punk? It's an older movie, but there's a kid um, who was uh, selling LSD, and this is actually, I've seen similar cases to this, um, where a kid was trying to sell LSD. And anyone know how LSD comes? It comes on blotter paper, basically, where you take the, the drugs of liquid, but you put it on paper that will, then you put it on the tongue, and it'll melt, and then you have absorption from there. Um, the kid was had it in his pocket, and then uh, the, he's running away from the campus police or something like that, and then the sprinklers came on. They ended up melting all the blotter paper, and then he ends up absorbing all of it and had this horrible hallucination. It's a very funny clip if you look it up, but similar things have happened. So sometimes you have to think about even thermal absorption or some of these things. But, um, again, benzos are going to be the best thing. I'd probably stay away from haloperidol for the most part. Usually benzos are going to be sufficient for most of these patients here. Okay. Uh, cocaine? What are some ways we can get cocaine in? Insufflation, right? Uh, you can snort it. What else? And smoke it, right? It's crack cocaine, right? So it depends if you're doing uh, cocaine hydrochloride or the free base form. Free, uh, the actual cocaine hydrochloride, the the fancy high end stuff. That stuff actually you can't smoke it because it actually pyrolyzes. It gets destroyed by the the high heat. But crack cocaine, you mix it with a base, all of a sudden you get this nice crack rock, and you can smoke that no problem. Um, it was interesting some of the different manifestations you can see with toxicity. If you remember back in the day, cocaine also does what? What other activities does it have? Sure, it's a stimulant, raise blood pressure and heart rate. What else does it do? It's an anesthetic. Remember, it blocks sodium channels. What would happen if I had that cocaine vapor started getting into the eyes? You start to lose your blink reflex because you don't have that sensation you need to blink, right? So people have developed corneal abrasions because of that. What happens if I'm constantly snorting cocaine and I'm causing all that vasoconstriction and that nasal mucosa? You have to develop uh, septal perforation there because, again, you're causing constant uh, uh, decreased oxygen delivery to the tissue there, right? So, again, lots of little atypical presentations to consider here. Um, but, again, depending on where you work, you'll see different flavors of it. I work downtown in Jacksonville, right? You saw right there on 8th Street, there's a ton, a ton of crack cocaine. Most people show them the ERs for crack chest pain, right? Because why do they get chest pain with cocaine? All that vasoconstriction, right? So, again, it's kind of clamping down all those coronary vessels. They probably have atherosclerosis to go along with it. Unless you had to roll out an MI for these patients, okay? So again, management's going to be pretty similar to the other stimulants we've already talked about, mostly benzos. And if you got to give them anything to get the blood pressure down, usually use a vasodilator along with something like a beta-blocking agent, you know, nipride, nicardipine, um, nitroprusside, anything like that is going to be pretty uh, effective there. Okay. Again, if they're hyperthermic, Cool them down if you need to. It's another key, port, uh, key point there to, to keep in mind as well. Um, again, therapy is mostly going to be supported. I have so much to cover. How many slides do I have left? Anyone know? 
Seven. You get through. Please. Hmm? Uh, how many? Oh, I had 20 slides left? <laughs> Holy cow. I had no idea. There's no way I'm going to get that done in this period of time. Um, so what would you like to do? <laughs> so I can uh, addend on a uh, additional portion. I'll try to go through the slides quickly and just hit the high points. You guys be okay if you watch that additional stuff? Or do I need to just finish it all now? I figured as much. Okay, so I'll go ahead and record the end of that. I'll post that up. I'll send an announcement when that's done. Uh, do you have any questions before I let you go? <laughs> Again, I try to respect your time, so please at least watch the video. There could be some useful stuff in there. I would recommend it. Anyway, uh, if not, uh, let me check the board real quick, see if there's any questions. Nothing at all. Okay, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>
that the biggest thing to do when you have that lead pipe rigidity is to use dantrolene and then possibly try to reverse the anti-dopaminergic effect by giving something like bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist. Now, in terms of sedative hypnotics, really benzos are going to be probably the more common thing you're going to see with this, but certainly barbiturates, uh, non-barbiturate medications like GHB, things like uh, Ambien, your, your sleep medications there, first-generation antihistamines, all these are really going to be doing the same thing and mainly causing that CNS depression. It's the most common thing. Note here that we don't have any sort of reversal agents for these. Um, you may find flumazenil can work a little bit for uh, things like Ambien and, and Lunesta, some of those benzo-like drugs used for sleep, but it's not done very commonly. I apologize for the phone call. I'll be right back. Sorry about that, but getting back to it, uh, again, treatment's mainly supportive here. Not a lot of romazicon being used, um, but that would only work for the benzos anyway. And again, we talked about the risk thereof. Now, lithium uh, is a really kind of dangerous one uh, that can kind of sneak up on you. This is the reason why a lot of patients got transitioned off of lithium onto other mood stabilizers like valproic acid and carbamazepine and whatnot. Um, just remember that uh, patients who are on it chronically and who have levels that have kind of been building up slowly over time are in a much more dangerous position than those that have an acute ingestion, mainly because lithium is a small charged ion, it has a hard time crossing over that blood-brain barrier. So if you've had a long time to accumulate that, you're much more likely to see um, the seizures and the other neuro neurologic uh, issues with that. Big thing you can also see with lithium is going to be the diabetes insipidus. So you should expect to have a lot of very copious amounts of urine, you may see hypernatremia due to that, um, possibility for hyperhypokalemia. Those are common things to see, um, but really the neuro stuff is what we're worried about, especially the chronic patients. Normally, uh, at therapeutic doses, you can see things like fine tremor and whatnot. It's really when you start to get the higher doses, like the two to threes, when you're going to start to see some, some you know, non-specific EKG changes, but really the seizures are the biggest thing we're worried about. Because once they start to seize, very difficult to treat. It's still going to be the same stuff, benzodiazepines and barbiturates and propofol, um, but uh, because that lithium is there and the brain's hard to cross back out of there, it's going to be hard to, uh, to really kind of get the seizures under control there. The biggest thing we can do to treat these patients is to use enhanced elimination. And as I mentioned before, lithium looks a lot like sodium. So if I give the body a lot of sodium, the kidneys are going to want to get rid of that. And so that actually stimulates diuresis. And where that sodium is going to go, lithium tends to follow. Again, a lot of these patients probably have high levels because they're in a more salt retentive state. Say they were dehydrated uh, or they're on, say they started an NSAID or an ACE inhibitor. Um, by giving them sodium chloride, same isotonic stuff we give for anyone else, 0.9%. That will help to enhance elimination of the lithium, get rid of it faster. Again, you usually get these levels every two hours is ideal. Oftentimes, it's not going to be possible just due to the logistics of a busy ER. And so you may need to do things like Q4 hours. Usually, once you kind of get an idea of where the trend is heading, and then you can start to back off and get them a little less frequently. Um, some patients have tried KX late before, but this is pretty slow. They're not really all that uh, effective here. The other big thing to note, though, is that you can use hemodialysis. If you're given that sodium chloride and it's still not uh, getting it levels down fast enough or that they develop a seizure, this is where you want to go ahead and use the hemodialysis. The level is about four, or if um, they develop any kind of seizures or if they have renal failure where you know they're not going to be able to uh, get rid of the drug on their own, this is where dialysis is going to be important. Now, insecticides, we know that a lot of these, especially the older agents or maybe in other countries, you're going to be seeing more um, acetylcholinesterase um, inhibiting drugs, right? Those are going to be your, mainly your organophosphate you're talking about. Now, we mentioned the mnemonic here is going to be uh, the old one, the sludge. We like the killer bees, so we're including in the bradycardia and the bronchorrhea. Those are mainly the muscarinic effects. Also remember, the nicotinic effects are going to exacerbate the bronchorrhea, the bronchospasm by causing diaphragmatic weakness, right? And that's going to lead to eventual respiratory failure there. Remember, uh, biggest thing, especially with any dermal decontamination, is get rid of the clothes and use soap and water to get rid of that. And then uh, make sure that we are using, um, uh, you know, atropine if they're having any severe muscarinic signs and symptoms. And then we'll talk about 2PAM as well being used in order to prevent the aging process in order to make sure that we um, will be able to kind of keep that acetylcholinesterase around as long as possible. Now getting into alcohols, uh, I'm sure some of you have probably experienced this before, but basically it's a CNS and possible respiratory depression. Again, that's going to be with very high doses. You're going to see that. Um, some patients may be at risk for hypoglycemia, especially uh, small kid, uh, kids uh, tend to be more likely to see this. 
Keep in mind um, that most patients are going to undergo what we call this uh, zero order kinetics, where they're going to be metabolizing roughly 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Um, it's roughly about a drink an hour or so. And keep in mind that 80 milligrams per deciliter is actually the legal limit. The other way you might see that reported is percent volume, and that's 0 0.08. So if you're 0 0.08, that's the legal limit there. Normally for these patients, observation is going to be most important. If you are having a patient who is malnourished chronically and they get most of their calories in through alcohol, this is where you want to make sure you're getting them lots of water-soluble vitamins like magnesium, folate, thiamine, etc. in order to get them repleted back. Thiamine and folate is really important as well to uh, stave off some of the other neurologic consequences like Wernicke's encephalopathy and, and Korsakoff and things like that. Now, on the other hand, if we have things like methanol, which is windshield washer fluid, um, basically this is going to be uh, going to cause kind of an overwhelming metabolic acidosis, but it's also going to cause uh, retinal toxicity. And this is why you get this classic snowstorm sort of blindness. So it kind of looks like a, uh, you know, static on a TV or something like that is what the patients will complain of. And they can't have permanent blindness due to methanol. Basically, the methanol gets broken down into formic acid, uh, formaldehyde, and that can actually lead to that retinal toxicity we see with that. Now, normally what we'll do is we will, um, again, not get charcoal because we won't bind to that, but ethanol is actually uh, protective. Now, if you remember when we've talked about metabolism of alcohol before, uh, there's an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, and that normally breaks down ethanol into aldehyde, acid aldehyde, and then that gets broken down by another enzyme. Well, methanol itself is intoxicating, but it's not particularly toxic in and of itself, besides the CNS depression it causes. So what happens, though, is that when alcohol dehydrogenase breaks it down into formaldehyde, basically, uh, that's when you end up seeing some of the toxicity develop. So by giving alcohol, and we used to do this, we used to use al alcohol drips intravenously, this would keep alcohol dehydrogenase busy, would keep it occupied, and prevent the methanol from being metabolized. So you kind of prevent the toxicity. It's only worked early on in ingestions because if they present late, then they may already have a lot of that formaldehyde formed. Nowadays, though, we actually use a uh, drug called flumepazole, or 4-MP, and that's actually a synthetic drug that is, does the same thing as alcohol. The benefit, though, is it does not cause your patients to be intoxicated. Other things we can do include uh, using dialysis, and that will also pull off the methanol pretty quickly there. Ethanglycol is seen in antifreeze, and it undergoes a similar um, reaction as methanol, but it gets converted over into all of this glycoaldehyde and oxalic acids. Where methanol mainly causes retinal toxicity, this is mainly going to cause uh, kidney toxicity, right? Basically, you can see acute kidney failure due to this. You will see hypocalcemia because the oxalic acid likes to bind to calcium. Uh, and uh, again, you're going to still see that overwhelming metabolic acidosis here. The treatment is going to be the same. Either ethanol needs to be used to keep alcohol dehydrogenase busy, or we can give them epazole, and then dialysis can also be used to pull it off. They may have some patients who ingest isopropanol or rubbing alcohol, and basically this is going to be treated the same as the typical ethanol ingestion. There's no specific toxicities to it. It is very, very hard on the stomach, and so you can see some uh, hemorrhagic gastritis associated with that, but oftentimes we don't need to dialyze these patients um, uh, very frequently. You can just let them sleep it off as the body will metabolize it. Interestingly, though, isopropanol gets broken down into acetone, so they may actually have a little bit of a fruity breath associated with uh, drinking this. It's not DKA. It's actually just the rubbing alcohol. So uh, that is the last slide we have here. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Actually, I lied. I realized that now there were three slides that were hidden there. Um, real briefly on carbon monoxide, again, the most common place you're going to see this is either from um, generators running in garages, from cars left on in garages, from fires and things like that. Um, the biggest thing we worry about with carbon monoxide is it will displace oxygen from hemoglobin and it forms carboxyhemoglobin essentially. Uh, basically, less hemoglobin to carry oxygen to the tissues means less tissue oxygenation means you're going to have a harder time, uh, you're going to develop kind of body-wide hypoxia. Basically, the first sort of headaches you're going to be finding is going to be headache, right? And, and especially younger patients and pregnant patients tend to be the ones that get more symptomatic from this. But headache will be the biggest thing. And you can see vomiting. You start to see confusion, syncope, MIs in some cases with really high levels. Um, and, it, of course, death can occur when you have the majority of your hemoglobin being bound up by carbon monoxide. You can remember you can check a level by getting an ABG with coximetry, And that will tell you the carboxyhemoglobin level and tell you what to do with that. 
The biggest thing you can do is make sure you're giving lots of oxygen, okay? This means giving uh, high flow oxygen via non-rebreather, and that will actually decrease the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin down to, um, say, you know, 90 minutes or so, right, versus it being much longer just on room air. And so basically it'll displace that carb carbon monoxide more quickly, the patient will breathe it off, and then you're good to go. Um, some patients have actually undergone hyperbaric chamber before where they will actually be put at um, two and a half to three times normal uh, atmospheric pressure and that again will cause oxygen to be a much higher concentration and will again increase that um, or decrease that half-life that much more to about 20 minutes or so but just know if you don't have access to hyperbaric chamber which most places don't you'll put them on oxygen and that's generally going to be um, good for the most part for them okay other than that that's it uh, if you have any questions please let me know thanks and i'll talk to you next time